there are many seemingly normal places in this world. But hidden behind the veil of normalcy can lie many, many secrets. This is the tale of one such place, and this tale intertwines history with myth and first-hand accounts of experiences and much more. From strange cryptid encounters to bizarre cult rituals and UFO sightings, there is much to uncover within, so join me as we decode the untold story of Black Star Canyon here on Mystery Archives. Black Star Canyon is known by many throughout the state of California as a wide open space full of family-friendly trails. However, it should be known for much more than just this. Unlike many of Southern California's trails, Black Star has been the site of a plethora of horrific events that have taken place throughout history, as well as a multitude of strange sightings, which we'll get into later. Located in Orange County, California, and the Santa Ana Mountains, the canyon was originally known as Canada de los Indios under Spanish rule and then later under Mexican rule as part of Alta California or Nueva California. The first known recorded negative event that took place there was in 1831. Local ranchers were being terrorized by horse thieves from the Shoshone tribe, a Native American tribe that was active in the area at the time. Unable to track the thieves down themselves, they banded together and were aided by a local mountain man named William Wolfskill. Over several weeks, Wolfskill and the ranchers tracked the thieves down until they came upon their encampment. Here, they discovered much more than they had bargained for. Not only had the tribesmen ate their horses, but they found several still cooking human limbs over the crackling campfire. Disturbed and angered, the ranchers overwhelmed the natives they encountered there and massacred them before then desecrating and leaving their remains. But this would be only one of many shocking events that would take place here and add to the darkness of the canyon. The land in which the massacre took place on would eventually fall into the hands of William Wolfskill and eventually a man named James Irving. After discovering coal deposits in the canyon, James Irving would co-found with a man named August Witt, the Black Star Coal Mining Company, in 1879, which gave the canyon its current name. The mine would pull an estimated six tons of coal each day, and was almost exclusively employed by the canyon's few residents. Many accidents would take place within the mine, including one incident where a man who was seemingly intoxicated fell to his death. This was later investigated by the law at the time, and the mining company was not found to be at fault. Many locals at this time of the operation believed the mine or the land could be haunted due to the frequent experiences of seeing apparitions and hearing disembodied voices throughout the mouth of the mine and the surrounding area. Many of the apparitions were described as natives adorned in tribal garb. The mining operation, like many during this era, soon became unprofitable, and the Black Star Mining Company was soon sold by Irving. It would later be replaced by the Santa Clara Mine, a much more successful and sustainable company that would lead to the sustainment of the town of Carbondale, located nearby. It would go on to operate until it closed for good in the early 20th century. Another unfortunate event that took place upon the land happened on June 9th, 1899, at a place called Hidden Ranch, located within the canyon. Hidden Ranch was owned by a man named Henry Hungerford of Norwalk and George Howard 
of Anaheim. On June 8, 1899, James Gregg, his brother-in-law, and a teenage boy by the name of Clint Hunt arrived to drive out cattle that Gregg owned and paid pasturage for on the land. That evening, a dispute broke out over unsettled debts between Gregg and the property owners. Howard owed Gregg $10 on a horse trade, and Gregg had an outstanding pasturage bill of $17.50. A total sum that would equal approximately $98,000 in today's money. While Greg insisted that Hungerford and Howard accept a settlement of $7.50, or about $26,000 in today's money, a heated exchange broke out between the two, but they eventually would go their separate ways and ultimately would go to bed for the night. However, the following morning, Upon reconvening, the argument simply started back up. Amidst the resumed dispute, Henry Hungerford would ultimately fatally shoot and kill James Gregg. It wasn't long after this incident that Hungerford was arrested and brought to the trial for the murder before Judge J.W. Ballard. Initially convicted of the murder, the trial results were overturned due to the judge granting a motion for a new trial, on the grounds that not enough evidence had been produced to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. Since no new evidence was available upon the start of the new trial, the district attorney, a man named R.Y. Williams, had no choice other than to dismiss the case. Henry Hungerford would get away with the murder of James Gregg, and since then, Many have claimed to see Greg near Hidden Ranch, and considering the circumstances in which he died, out of a lapse of judgment, heated emotions, and reaction, it wouldn't surprise me if his soul was still wandering the land, even to this day. Besides events of the distant past, there have been more modern tragedies to take place within the canyon as well. I'll be focusing on the ones that took place directly in the geographical area of Blackstar, and not the surrounding areas. It's been rumored but cannot be confirmed that in the 1970s, a bus driver lost control of the bus that transported local children to and from school. The bus then subsequently crashed into the Blackstar Canyon, killing everyone who was on board. The corpse of the bus then sat within the canyon for more than 40 years until it was removed in 2013. Many people have reported being pushed by what felt like child's hands and hearing children whispering and laughing near the bus when it was still there, but there was never anyone around. In 2001, in a brazen act of evil, Two men and three boys associated with a gang known as the LTK Crew were arrested after the beating of two teenage boys and the violation of their teenage girlfriends within Black Star. The suspects confessed to being under the influence of alcohol prior to the attack and began also taking drugs while the attacks were in progress and after they had taken place as well. In 2002, a very sad and unfortunate event also took place. Nicholas Anderson and his brother Glenn Anderson entered the Blue Light Mine in hopes of exploring the abandoned mine and having an adventure, but the two brothers tragically would never make it out alive. Oxygen levels inside the mine were recorded at only 4%. The mine, which has a total of 11 entrances, only had three properly blocked off at the time of the Anderson brothers' deaths. There has since been a project in place to seal the additional entrances to prevent any further tragedies from taking place. Of just the several events that we've covered so far, as I've mentioned before in previous videos similar to this one as well, some believe that unspeakable events of evil, such as murder or massacre, or even untimely death can oftentimes leave a wound upon the land and a haunting, as some believe, 
is similar to a scar upon the land, where the event has long since passed, but the energy of it, once having taken place there, still exists. One theory that's been discussed is that the majority of the canyon is comprised of limestone, which has long since been debated by the paranormal community since the 1970s to be a type of stone that captures and stores bursts of energy, like those that would have been discharged at the prior events mentioned. Could this possibly be contributing to the hauntings and other strange events taking place within Black Star Canyon today? Another theory is that many believe the canyon to be a kind of portal, whether that's to another dimension, the other side, or something else entirely, such as a different universe. It's hard to say, but the following stories may pique your interest as to why they feel this way. Satanic rituals and strange cult activity have long been associated with Black Star Canyon, with many visitors reporting hooded figures, unexplained fires, and chanting. Some have even reported witnessing the sacrifice of an animal. Hikers have discovered satanic imagery carved into various stones along trails, used black candles, animal skulls, and bloody objects. Many of these claims could be dismissed as legend or an overactive imagination according to most, but could there be more to these claims than mere speculation? Through some digging, I found a reference. As noted in the book, The Truth About Freemasons, the Illuminati, and the New World Order by SDS and CMW. An individual who used the alias Pendar claimed to be a member of the Illuminated Brotherhood, also known as the Illuminati to most. This individual claimed to be from the Alsace-Lorraine region of France and would attend major satanic ceremonies in Europe and parts of the United States regularly. One such ritual was said to have originally been hosted on a regular basis in the Trabuco Canyon in California. However, urban sprawl and development led the organizers to move the rites to Black Star Canyon instead. If this were true, it could possibly tie in or contribute to some of the legends that you're about to hear. Many strange things have been spotted within Black Star. One of those is a sighting of an ape-like creature within the canyon and throughout the surrounding area. Aside from dozens of reports by locals and tourists alike having claimed to have seen the creature, it has also been documented as being seen on four different occasions by four different rangers. This is a photo of one alleged encounter. Could the activity of one or several dark cults have brought forth something into our world that isn't supposed to be here? Or is it something that's lived here all along? Another strange creature that has been witnessed draws from an old Spanish folktale. The Spanish, of course, controlled the area prior to Mexico, and the folktale is that of La Llorona. There are many origin tales, but from my research, it seems that La Llorona, or the Weeping Woman, was a woman named Maria who married a wealthy man who she eventually bore two children to. As time went on, she began to see her husband less and less, and when he was home, he only ever paid attention to the children. Eventually, she would see her husband with another woman. Out of jealousy, and mania one night, she drowned her two children. Immediately regretting this horrid decision, she then drowned herself. She was denied entry through heaven's gates and now searches the world for her lost children, often being seen in a white bridal gown with a disfigured or animal-like face. She's typically seen floating in bodies of water and attacks children, as well as adults. There is a well that is rumored to exist within the canyon, where she lives, and she's been rumored to have manifested and come out of that well, only to drag whoever or whatever she preys upon 
deep into its depths. Black Star Canyon also seems to be a hot spot for EVPs or electronic voice phenomena. Disembodied but audible voices have been heard and recorded by many individuals while visiting. The sounds of distant chanting, weeping, and even growling have been reported as well, all with no visible origin. Many people have also reported seeing things out of the corner of their eye, only when they turn, there's nothing there. This activity could tie into the limestone theory, or even the occult activity that's taken place there. Perhaps energy over the ages has been stored within the stone, or perhaps an otherworldly vortex exists within the canyon itself, whether it's always been there or was open due to evil practices is anyone's guess. This vortex that I've mentioned could be a spiritual one, but others have often speculated that it could be some kind of wormhole or interdimensional portal instead. Many people wanting to escape the urban lifestyle of Orange County have taken to places like Black Star Canyon due to its relatively quiet environment and unparalleled views of the sky a place where things aren't obstructed by city lights. Over the years, a plethora of UFO activity has been documented and reported over Black Star. And although there is occasionally planes overhead due to John Wayne Airport nearby, many have noted very strange craft with pulsing lights, unlike anything they've ever seen before within the night sky there. As previously mentioned, Many people have reported seeing things out of the corner of their eye, only for there to be nothing there, but people have also reported being stalked and even pursued by something aggressive and yet unseen. Could this perhaps be something that was dropped off by a UFO, a terrifying and abhorrent creature created in an alien lab somewhere, or is this a spirit or something else completely unknown? Those who have encountered such entities and have lived to tell the tale, I'm sure will not be going back anytime soon, and I can't blame them. Many creatures have been mentioned due to Black Star Canyon being a hot spot of many different types of supposed activity, but there is another type of creature or creatures that I'd like to mention as well, although these certainly seem less menacing. Originally spotted on January 23rd of 1995 by a group of friends hunting within the canyon, they were described as the Black Star Waddlers. These were small entities that were approximately two feet tall, dark in color, and had a notable waddle as they walked by. They typically would be seen in groups and were spotted several times by the first party prior to their hunt being over. The creatures would also be spotted by another group later that year, and again in 1998. And although not much is known about them, they don't appear to be hostile, but for those who witnessed them, it would certainly make for a very strange trip, and even a stranger story, indeed. While many of the trails and open spaces of Black Star Canyon are still regularly traveled during the day, Many refuse to traverse the space at night. There is said to be an uncomfortable and noticeable shift in energy from relative happiness and normalcy to that of malice and uncertainty. While the majority of known history, legends, and sightings have all been mentioned in this video, there are old details that we may possibly never know and others that will be kept from us about this place. There are also still stories and new experiences being written and told, as those with an insatiable curiosity for the unexplained continue to hike Black Star Canyon. So if you find yourself in California and want to experience the weird, then Black Star Canyon might just be the place for you. But if I were you, I wouldn't recommend staying too long, because you may never leave. After a flood destroys their home, a family is forced to relocate to a new home, which they believe is going to be a fresh start for them. However, 
it turns out to be a fresh new hell instead. From demonic attacks, nightmarish visuals, and terrifying manifestations, this is one haunting story you won't want to miss. This is the untold story of the Smurl haunting in Pennsylvania and the monstrous creature that stalked its walls. The timeline of events is rough at best, but I have done my best to make the most coherent retelling of the story, so please keep that in mind. Raging floods as a result of Hurricane Agnes have destroyed the homes of many families, and one such family was the Smurls. The Smurl family consisted of Janet and Jack Smurl and their four young children, Heather, Shannon, Karen, and Dawn. With their home destroyed in the Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania area, feeling as if they had been uprooted and tossed about like the rushing waters that took their house, the Smurls decide to temporarily relocate to West Pitson, where Jack's parents currently lived. After explaining the situation and staying with the couple for a short time, they were surprised and ultimately blessed when Jack's parents proposed an idea to them. They had found an old duplex, a bit of a fixer-upper, also in West Pitson. The two of them could live on one side, and Jack, Janet, and the kids on the other. That way, they could look out for one another, and of course spend more time together. Not in a position to or wanting to say no, Jack and Janet humbly accepted their offer, but all too soon they would be confronted with the question, was this blessing truly a curse? With Jack's parents paying for them all to move into the new house, they soon find themselves rehomed and living in the newly purchased duplex. Located on Chase Street there in West Pitson, although the home would need some work, the neighborhood seemed friendly and inviting, a good place to raise a family. The family collectively puts their efforts into repainting, retooling, and other repairs, but in no time, the slightly run-down home was feeling fresh, vibrant, and modern, making the Smurls feel ever more at home and hopeful for the future. However, this would not last forever for it seemed that each time they banged a hammer, each time they drove a nail into a wall, and with every drop of paint, they woke something up within the house itself, something that perhaps had been slumbering there for quite some time. During this time, small episodes of strangeness began to manifest. Seeming rather benign at first, tools began to disappear only to reappear hours later in different spots. Old stains that covered the walls began to seep through the fresh coats of paint, and several appliances in their kitchen had mysteriously caught fire, even though they were unplugged. Along with these oddities, the family would also begin to smell awful odors that overwhelmed the entire house, like an omnipresent floating cloud of rotting meat that hung over them only to disperse mere moments later, after being detected. But despite these weird events, the family didn't really think much of it. They were just thankful to have a roof over their heads. Jack and Janet continued to rebuild their lives. Jack, fortunately, had since gotten a better job than the one he had had previously, and was promoted during this time. He was also able to coach his daughter's softball team, the children had reacclimated to a new school and were getting good grades, and Janet had become pregnant with baby number five and also helped organize an anti-drunk driving group at the local high school. And Jack's parents were doing great as well. But all of this positivity, unfortunately, would not last. By 1974, things began to change for the Smurls. It began when Mary Smurl, Jack's mother suffered a heart attack. This led to the entire family struggling to make ends meet, and whether it was a result of the renovations or something else, something paranormal had began to manifest. 
and make itself known. It began when Janet began to hear the voice of her mother-in-law, who shortly after her heart attack was now at home and recovering. Doing what she could to help her, she would hear her name being called out from Mary and would rush to her aid to help her with anything and everything that she could possibly need. But the strange thing was, Mary at times would either be unconscious, sleeping, or wouldn't have had called for her at all. Attributing this bizarre phenomena to stress at first, she writes it off. However, Mary soon starts experiencing her own strangeness. She too, as if the words had come from Janet's mouth herself, would hear her name being called. Only when confronted, Janet would have no idea what she was talking about. But that wasn't all, of course. The stains that had previously been painted over and were thought to be covered began to seep through yet again, and new stains began to appear as well, with several appearing on the hardwood floors of the home. As the days progressed, the oldest small child soon began to experience the presence as well. She would often be woken up in the dead of night, frozen with fear and unable to move. She would see translucent figures standing above her or at the edge of her bed, staring and watching her. And although it wasn't exclusive to the midnight hour, the activity seemed to pick up at night. Often, when Jack was at work or gone, Janet began to have violent and sickening encounters with a being that she couldn't see. She began to be molested by an unseen force. These interactions left her hysterical, feeling violated and unclean. Trying to come to terms with what was happening to them, the family's luck continued to worsen. Additional appliances, including a TV set, went up in flames, causing smoke and fire damage to the home on several occasions. And unlike the TV, the other appliances were not plugged in in order for the family to save money, which makes it all the more mysterious. On top of this, several water pipes which are fairly new after the family had initially renovated the home began to leak not only causing water damage to the house, but adding to their financial woes as well. The string of bad luck would continue for the Smurls, and by 1977, the activity in the home became much more aggressive. The family's radio began to turn itself on and off, typically at strange hours, and almost always when the family was trying to sleep. The sinks in their bathrooms began to turn themselves on, pouring what little money they had left literally down the drain, and their toilets began to flush by themselves. Along with this activity, the sounds of footsteps began to be heard all throughout the house, and even on the insides of the walls. Drawers began to open and close by themselves, and coupled with these happenings, was again the stench of rotting meat, but the family would begin to describe as the dead smell, except instead of dissipating almost as soon as it was detected before or in one particular area of the house. The smell would permeate all throughout the house and would linger for minutes or sometimes even hours. Up until this point, besides seeing things being moved, dealing with the stains, pipes, and appliances. Jack hadn't been targeted, so to speak, by whatever paranormal force that was now fully awake within the Smurl residence. But one night, when he was trying to get some sleep after a long day's work, his side of the sheets were pulled from his body, and the sensation of dozens of hands touching and grabbing him ensured that not only was he not going to get the rest that night due to sheer terror, but that perhaps his wife had been telling the truth. Janet, shortly after moving into the house, had become pregnant, and this time had given birth to two baby girls, expanding the Smurl family to six children. Shortly after the twins were brought home, it seemed like whatever presence that had been woken up was making itself known. It became more aggressive, more vindictive, 
as if it was jealous or hated the living. One morning, while the majority of the children were at school and napping, and the rest of the adults were out, Janet was headed to the kitchen to pour herself a freshly brewed cup of coffee. As she turned around the corner, her blood ran cold. Standing in the middle of the kitchen, with a stain seeming to materialize directly underneath it, it was a translucent figure with hollow eyes. Frozen in place upon seeing it was if she blinked and whatever this creature was, was gone. Was this what was responsible for the multitude of paranormal happenings within their house? As time progressed, Janet again would continue to hear her name being called out when no one else was there, over and over and over again. Strangely, as it was before in the beginning, the voices would often sound like her mother-in-law, Mary, and even after double or triple checking sometimes to make sure she wasn't losing her mind, Mary would be nowhere to be found. Janet truly was alone. Other strange things that were heard during this time would be heard from the other side of the duplex. Couples do argue, and some fight. That just tends to happen to most, unfortunately. But these fights were something else. Jack's parents began to hear yelling and screaming, sometimes even items breaking, coming from the other side of the duplex where Jack and Janet lived. These fights became so violent that not only did they think their marriage was collapsing, but they began to become concerned for Janet and the children's safety. One night, Jack's father couldn't take it anymore. He walked from their front door to the other side, and with the fight still raging, he threw the door open, only to be greeted with silence. The entire family was asleep. Not knowing what to make of this discovery, he simply left, bewildered. But the supposed audio of the fights would continue. Shortly after the bizarre discovery, Mary would experience something that almost gave her another heart attack. One evening, while her husband was still at work and she was alone on their side of the duplex, she began to hear her name being whispered and it sounded like Janet, but it was right within earshot or several feet of where she had been. Weirded out as most of us would be, she began to make her way towards the voice that was calling out to her. And that's when she saw it, standing in her living room, with a stain seeping underneath its feet, was the same translucent being that Janet had claimed she had seen just a short while ago. And terrifyingly, its mouth was mimicking Janet's voice and calling out her name. Frozen in terror at first, with her heart racing, Mary ran to the door, exited, and immediately went into Jack and Janet's door, absolutely petrified with fear. The talks that followed this event in particular is what led to most of the individual experiences being laid out in the open for everyone to know. They would all come to the realization that whatever force that was in their house was not friendly. Shannon Smurl who was only seven years old during this time, would be the next target. One day, as she casually walked through the kitchen and into the dining room, a large glass light fixture fell and crashed into her, cutting her and raising the alarm bells for the entire house. Again, it seemed like the paranormal being or force hated life and now was possibly trying to end it if the opportunity presented itself. Scared but strapped for cash, they were all seemingly stuck in what was supposed to be their fresh start, but instead at this point was becoming their fresh hell. Shannon would continue to experience strangeness of her own as well. In her diary and later, she would recount that oftentimes she would wake up and find herself floating above her bed. Literally, levitating several feet above her bed. Some nights, while floating, she would suddenly be thrown across the room 
and into a wall with so much force that she thought she would be crushed. The climax of these attacks on Shannon happened one night when she woke up to find herself floating once again. But instead of being let back down or smacked into a nearby wall, her door was flung open and she was thrown out of her room and down the stairs. Her parents heard this happen and rushed towards the screams of their little girl to find her absolutely hysterical and in pain. Fortunately, however, she would be okay physically after this event in particular. Another unfortunate soul that would be targeted in the Smurl duplex was the family's German shepherd, Simon. Simon would be found floating in the air, confused and concerned. And this new development and activity was not just exclusive to Shannon or their beloved dog. Alongside the intensified attacks on Janet, she too would begin finding herself woken up in the middle of the night, floating in the air and sometimes, horrifically, without control of her body, she would then also be assaulted. However, Jack wasn't always gone at this time. Frequently at this point, he would be home and sleeping beside her, but could never seem to wake up as if he was being kept asleep or in a state of paralysis while the events took place. Coupled along these intense and abhorrent manifestations, activity that was plain creepy. Not a day would go by without the family hearing scratching noises coming from within the walls, or deep, drawn-out breaths coming from behind them, feeling the exhale upon their necks, making the hairs on their entire body stand on end. Jack at times, after a hard day's work, would like to unwind and decompress by watching some TV in the living room. On occasion, he would fall asleep to whatever was on, before eventually waking back up and making his way to bed. However, this night, he found himself awake and coherent, but unable to move, as if he was paralyzed or stuck in some kind of a glue trap, like an insect. Unable to break free, he glanced around the room trying to discover the source of his distress. It was here that he was met face to face with this being, this demon that seemed to be plaguing their lives. The creature grabbed him from the back and slammed him onto the floor, began repeatedly bashing his head into the hard wood below before disappearing. After this, Jack didn't watch TV to unwind anymore. As a matter of fact, no one could unwind. They were petrified at whatever was taking place in the house. Unable to afford to move between all the adults, and seemingly stuck between a rock and a hard place, scared and unable to figure out what to do, they began to seek help wherever they thought they could find it. It was now winter, and the family, besides their daily duties, spent most of their time indoors. While watching TV one afternoon, they saw an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, world-renowned paranormal experts and demonologists. Not being particularly religious and unsure of where to turn, they decided to reach out to the couple and were surprised when they made contact. After speaking with them for some time, the Warrens agreed to come to their house to meet in person with the Smurls and to investigate. And within a week, that's exactly what they did. After an initial meeting with the family, hearing their testimonies in person, and after exploring the home, the Warrens decide it seems genuine and it's worth investigating, and they begin their usual process of bringing in their team for an extended period of time to document and mull over potential solutions for the family. After several months of the documenting team living with the family, and experiencing strange activity themselves, such as furniture stacking on top of itself, along with several other previously mentioned happenings, such as the stains and attacks on individual members of the home. Lorraine finally comes to the conclusion, after having a vision within the house, that they were dealing with a total 
of four entities. One was that of an old woman, who she believed was not a threat to the family, but was simply being held against her will within the home. One was a younger woman, who was angry and resentful, and could be violent. And the other was a man who took the life of his wife and his lover, and had been hanged in the same spot a hundred years earlier by a vengeful crowd. The final entity was that of a demon, and this demon not only was strong in keeping the other three spirits under its heel of control, but would use them to strengthen itself and wreak havoc upon the family, to sow discord, anxiety, and fear, all things to which it could feed on and continue to grow stronger. After reaching this conclusion and having gathered sufficient information, the Warren spoke to Father McKenna, who was a Vatican-sanctioned exorcist and had worked with them over 50 times on separate cases in the past, so he was no stranger to the demonic. But after his arrival and attempted exorcism, the activity only increased in aggression and hostility, and for whatever reason, it was not tied to the home anymore but rather the family members themselves. Jack began to experience horrific visions of the creature at work, as did his father. And alongside the continued paranormal activity taking place at their home, their daughter Karen fell seriously ill with a fever that the doctors couldn't diagnose at the time and almost died. Several of the other girls were also visited by the sickening presence at night as Janet also was and continued to be. The demon also began to physically attack the family more often, causing stinging scratches and cuts on their bodies at random times, as well as deep and bruising bite marks. Still trying to help the family rid themselves of this creature and fearing for the family's continued torment, the Warrens convinced the Smurls to allow a second exorcism to take place and McKenna again would visit and conduct a second exorcism months later in the early spring. During this exorcism ritual, EVPs were recorded, which when played back after the fact, would reveal multiple entities laughing at and berating them for their efforts. Ed Warren would also be choked during this visit and would be incapacitated for multiple days after. Unfortunately, the second exorcism also failed, leading to even more violent manifestations of evil. Trying to get away from it all for even just a few days, the family went on a camping trip to the Pocono Mountains, but the demon would follow them there as well, tormenting them wherever they went, allowing for no rest, no decompression, and no peace. Upon returning to their home following this trip and getting even more desperate, they decided to reach out to a local TV show called People Are Talking to see if anyone could possibly help them. They did, however, remain anonymous during their interview, and this call for help, however, went unanswered, but the demon seemed to retaliate against them for it. Janet would once again be hurled against a wall and Jack would experience something truly terrifying and new. As he woke up in the early morning to get ready for work before the sun had come up, a light rain tapped the glass of the windows outside. As he dressed himself and began to gather his things for his workday departure, he came down the stairs and was greeted by a disgusting and horrid creature. Standing in front of the door was a monstrous being whose head almost touched the ceiling. It resembled a horrible amalgamation of a man and a pig, standing upright on two legs. It screeched and rushed towards him, but as he fell backwards onto the stairs, hurting his back, the creature stood over him, face to face, snarling, before it disappeared. This manifestation disturbed and rattled Jack to his core. The same morning shortly after Jack had left for work, because although terrified, he still had to provide for his family if they ever wanted to have a chance 
of escaping this hellscape of a home. Janet was woken up a short while later by a hand reaching up through her mattress and grabbing the back of her neck and pulling her towards it and choking her. After these events, horrific snarling noises like that of a pig could be heard coming from inside the walls. The time was now August of 1986, and the Smurls felt that the risk of ridicule did not outweigh the need for their story to reach a wider audience, so that somehow, somewhere, someone could possibly help them be freed from this torment. They would soon be granted an interview with the Wilkes Bar Sunday newspaper, but instead of someone reading and immediately coming to their aid, their home quickly became a tourist attraction instead. The press, skeptics, and curious onlookers alike began to visit the house and camp outside of it at all hours of the day and night, with some particularly weird people even coming up and staring into the home's windows themselves. Some of their neighbors who had seen and heard strange things coming from the small residence began to turn on them. They believed that the family was concocting some kind of a story to try and make money. Eventually, however, despite the torment inside and outside of the home now that they were experiencing, the Smurls would be contacted by a medium by the name of Mary Alice Rinkman, who offered to meet with them. Upon meeting the family and walking through the home, it was also Mary's conviction that there were four entities within the house, three human spirits, and one who had never been human, thus corroborating the Warrens' beliefs about the situation as well. She would, however, take things a bit further. She identified the old woman by the name of Abigail, the murderous man as Patrick, and the violent and ill-tempered spirit as Patrick's wife. And the fourth entity, of course, could not be identified by name, but was indeed a very powerful demon. The press coverage, despite the ridicule and the positive acquaintance of Mary, also had pushed the Scranton Catholic Diocese into action as well. They offered to take over the investigation. In the meantime, the Warrens had not given up on the family, but rather had reached out to several more priests and had arranged for a mass exorcism to be conducted with four priests taking part, as well as multiple prayer groups. Alongside this, now Bishop McKenna came in for a third and final time and conducted an exorcism on the house for the family. And fortunately, the ritual, at least for a time, seemed to work because following it, there were no disturbances for about three months. But as winter set in that year, just before Christmas of 1986, Jack would again see the creature that had tormented him. For all of those years. This time, however, it beckoned him to allow it to take over. But clutching a rosary in his pocket that had been gifted to him by the church, he prayed as hard as he could, and thankfully this time, the demon vanished, never to be seen again. However, the putrid smells and violent manifestations would return and continue day in and day out. Frustrated, hopeless, and exhausted, the Smurls by this point had finally saved enough to be able to leave this dreaded duplex on Chase Street and decided they needed the closest thing to a fresh start as they could get. So when they finally did move, they moved to a completely new town, one where the ridicule would not find them. But like the terrible pattern shown before, the demon did not seem to be tied to the property, but rather the family. The activity started back up almost as soon as they had moved in and laid their heads to rest in their new home. It would take some time, but in 1988, the church finally sanctioned a fourth exorcism, but this time at their new residence, and this finally seems to have given the family peace. A few things I would like to mention, however, are these. From my own personal experience and many other stories I've researched, it seems like renovations, particularly on older homes, can wake up dormant spirits or hauntings. Perhaps this is what happened to the Smurls. 
It's hard to tell if the assaults were one or multiple demonic entities, but if they did truly exist, how did they get in the home to begin with? And my guess is that the collection of negative energy attracts them, like moths to a flame. Perhaps they enjoy or feed off of human suffering. This would only make sense to me considering that they hate humans and refuse to bow to them in the beginning. Perhaps once they're embedded in one's life, they continue to sow said suffering to exploit and grow stronger, ultimately trying to take the human's life and their soul back with them to hell. I would also like to mention that scratching on a person and inside the walls as well as disembodied breathing, are all signs of demonic infestation, and for one reason or another, having actually experienced this personally, seeing the manifestation of a pig-like demon, or a creature, as well as hearing pig snarling coming from within the walls, is considered to be a serious or incredibly strong sign of a very strong demonic infestation. As far as the initial activity, the seeping through of the stains, the sinks turning on, toilets flushing on their own, and leaky pipes. Those initially could be written off as poor skill when the work was initially done. But it seemed like with this story, all of these things were working perfectly fine for months before they all of a sudden, almost at the same time, began to go wrong while costing the family money that they didn't have. And money at the time seemed to be their main issue as well as the paranormal. So perhaps the demon knew and exploited this to add to the misery it was feeding on. But truly, at the end of the day, the conclusion is yours to make. Was the Smurl haunting legitimate, or just another tale concocted for money, or inside the broken minds of individuals who claim to have experienced it? Let me know down in the comments below. They would eventually release a book about all they had experienced, called The Haunted, in 1988, but financials or how successful it was was never released, at least not from what I could find. But what I do know is this, it's extremely important to examine a situation from all angles just before diving into it. Although a place might seem like a fresh new start, it could indeed be your fresh new hell, and those renovations that you think are going to improve your quality of life could awaken something that has been watching and waiting for a new host to attach itself to and feed upon until it can wear it down, rot, and eventually drag it back to the depths from where it came from. What once seemed like a miraculous place to its early settlers slowly but surely collapsed under the weight of its own profits and debauchery. And it's now said that the land and all items within this abandoned town are now cursed. This is a strange tale that intertwines legend with history. This is the untold story of Bodie, California. The year was 1859 and mining had began to decline along the western slope of the Sierra Nevada. Prospectors in search of riches beyond their wildest dreams began to cross the eastern slope. One such man was named William S. Bodie. During his expedition, Bodie would find gold near a place now known as Bodie Bluff. He would make camp there and continue to take his chances in order to collect his riches. His supplies and food would grow scarce, but his stash of gold nuggets was growing ever larger. Powered by his insatiable love for a better life, Bodhi continued on. However, as the year progressed and winter came over the area, he unfortunately would breathe his last breath. Bodhi died in a snowstorm that very winter and would later be discovered by the future inhabitants of the town that would come to bear his name. His story in its own way would manifest within the settlement, even down to its last days. As the search for gold continued, Bodhi's gold vein would be rediscovered, and slowly but surely, a mine was established, as well as a mill. The year was now 1861, 
and the town known as Bodie was home to 20 miners. For the next 17 years to come, its population would grow steadily, but it would remain a rather insignificant mining camp, and that was until the mill was sold. Bunker Hill Mine, as it came to be known on the west slope of Bodie Bluff, would change hands several times within the 17 years, until it came into the possession of Standard Mining Company. It was originally sold because the owners of Bunker Hill Mine at the time believed that the well had run dry, so to speak, since their profits and gold discovery had been on a downward trajectory for many years. But after it was sold to Standard, it was as if a miracle had taken place. Just months after the sale, a significant vein of rich gold ore was discovered. Profits, as a result, rose dramatically. And by 1878, Bodie's population had soared to over 5,000 people. It's estimated that the mine would yield nearly $15 million worth of gold over the next 25 years. Profits that would be worth an estimated $400 million in today's money. Although all seemed to be going great in Bodie, there were many hardships yet in store for the fledgling town and its citizens. The winter of 1878 was particularly savage. It's estimated that over 200 people would lose their lives, either due to exposure, hypothermia, or disease. Others would be taken by fallen timber, and one of several explosions to take place within the mines, as the powder magazine mysteriously ignited. But despite the horror of the winter frost, Bodhi continued to grow. People of almost every walk of life would end up there, from miners to gamblers, prostitutes, and businessmen. And by 1879, it had doubled in size to over 10,000 residents. It had added an additional 2,000 buildings, and before long it supported over 30 gold mines, 65 saloons, and untold amounts of brothels, gambling halls, and opium dens. Opposite the brothels, gambling, and opium smoking, the town also had several churches, banks, and schools. Three breweries within the town worked day and night brewing whiskey and 100 gallon barrels because Bodie seemed to have an insatiable thirst for alcohol. Like a perfect storm, Bodie would soon earn a reputation for violence, lawlessness, and debauchery of every kind. Killings at times were daily events. Robberies, stick-ups, and street fights all became frequent occurrences as well, as the town seemed to turn its back on God and worship its newfound idol, one of gold and profit. It seemed like the good times for those who indulged themselves would never end, but they would. Given Bodhi's reputation, it's perhaps not surprising that one little girl, whose family was moving to the mining town, reportedly prayed, Goodbye, God. We are going to Bodhi. For all of its construction, Bodhi needed vast amounts of lumber, and the problem was that there were scarce trees in the area. Soon, several businessmen formed the Bodie and Benton Railroad Company in 1881 for the sole purpose of sustaining that appetite for much needed lumber. However, for the citizens of Bodie, this was not a good decision. In order to maximize profits, the company hired an expensive Chinese labor, much to the outrage of the locally unemployed. So with a large influx of cheap foreign labor, it soon helped drive the competing labor costs into the ground, not just for the railroad, but for mining as well. This marked the beginning of the end of the town. The boom was over just one year later. In 1882, Bodie started to rapidly decline. Prior to 1882, there were no churches within the town, but there were two preachers, one Methodist and one Catholic who held services in their private homes. And despite of the town's decline, 
two churches would be built in 1882, one for each of the two faiths. However, both would not end up surviving. After the merging of Bodhi and the Standard Mining Companies in 1887, the town saw a brief revival in both wealth as well as population, but that too would be short-lived. A series of fires would soon extinguish Bodhi for good. In 1892, a fire ravaged much of the business district, further depleting the population. And in 1898, a massive fire broke out and destroyed the once prosperous mill. And although it was a slow burn, metaphorically speaking, as far as the decline of the town, the final nail in the coffin was in 1932, when a two-year-old boy who had gotten a hold of his father's matches ended up lighting a fire that would destroy 95% of all buildings left within the town. In the years to come, Prohibition and the Great Depression would entomb Bodhi, and although attempts were made to strike new gold, companies once record profits crashed. We are thus left with a tale of a city that flew too close to the sun and burned, showing that chasing profit and vanity, debauchery and lust yield a disastrous long-term consequences. After World War II, only six people lived in the old settlement, and five of these six would soon meet strange and untimely deaths. The first was a man who seemingly went mad. Out of the clear blue sky, he woke up one day, loaded his pistol, and shot his wife in broad daylight in the town center. Three men witnessed this take place and quickly took action, which would lead to the death of the man who had just killed his wife. And this is where things take a very weird turn indeed. According to each man, the ghost of the murdered man would visit them individually, tormenting them and forbidding their rest. Soon, all three would die of a mysterious and painful disease. Details on their condition are scarce, but thick and painful boils were said to envelop them, and within a matter of agonizing weeks, they would all perish. But the strange happenings didn't seem to stop with just those three men. After this, Bodhi truly became a ghost town. By 1962, after years of neglect, it was designated a state historical park by the state of California, and legends about this place seemingly stuck in time. One such legend is known as the Bodhi Curse. Supposedly, if visitors take anything from this town, even a pebble, they will forever be cursed with terrible misfortune. One such victim claimed to have been struck with horrible luck and tragedy until they returned an item that they had stolen from a previous visit. And this isn't entirely speculation or superstition, however. The park's own rangers claim it's a real phenomenon. Years ago, they began to keep a log of anyone who would offer to tell them that they were taking something from Bodhi. And the logbook also contains pages upon pages of those same people returning those items and claiming the notorious curse. The curse is said to be perpetuated by the ghosts that live there, who guard their riches against thieves as they are still searching for new gold. And despite the park rangers vouching for the happenings, many believe it's nothing more than silly superstition, but I for one wouldn't want to be the guy to test this out. There are many places I'd be willing to go to investigate, with Bodhi being one of them. But why take the chance of destroying your life for something that wasn't yours to begin with? Another ghostly legend is that of the haunting of the J.S. Kane house at the corner of Green and Park Streets. James Stewart Kane, or J.S. Kane, had arrived in Bodie when he was just 25 years old. Soon after his arrival, he entered the lumber transporting business and soon became a mogul. He would go on to own the Bodie Bank, a leasing company, and became the primary property owner within the town. 
The home is said to be haunted by the restless spirit of a Chinese maid. The maid apparently loves children who visit, but hates adults. Adults sleeping in the old house have said to be awakened, frightened, and breathless, feeling the weight of another person sitting on their chest. Others have experienced doors opening and closing by themselves, and have even seen the apparition of the spirit herself knitting in the chair in the main room. And this isn't the only place that's claimed to be haunted that still stands there. The Mendicini House is called home to several friendly ghosts. One who is thought to be Mrs. Mendicini herself. She loved cooking large Italian meals for her family. Guests and park rangers alike have reported smelling delicious aromas emanating from the house. Although no one has cooked there for over a hundred years. Others have seen the spirit of a woman peering out of the top window of the Dockenbu house, almost as if the woman is still alive, but trapped in another time, still dressed as though it's the early 1900s. And yet another ghost is known as the Angel of Bodhi, and her home is the Bodhi Cemetery. There is an old angel statue that sits to guard her grave. The angel was a three-year-old little girl who was said to have been accidentally killed when she was hit in the head by a slipped miner's pickaxe. Visitors have heard giggling, feeling a small hand tugging on their pant legs, and others have seen a little girl run from tombstone to tombstone, but upon rushing to find her, there's never anyone there. Bodhi is now in a state of arrested decay. There are no permanent residents of the town except the park employees, and only about 10% of the original buildings still stand. In this ghost town, there are no maps, no restaurants, or recreations. Here you get the real ghost town experience. So if you find yourself in California and feel like taking a walk through time, Bodhi just might be the place for you. But just remember, don't take anything, or you just might become its newest resident ghost. Lying dormant within the streets of suburbia, there is an unseen evil. Like a mouse falling into a pit of snakes, an unsuspecting family disturbed a slumbering force and became enshrouded in a fog of darkness. This is the untold story of the Bel Air House and the terrifying malevolent entities that dwell within its walls. Bel Air, Ohio, an area rich in history, was once known as Glass City, having once been a major glass production hub in the late 1800s, is now known as the All-American Town having been used in many Hollywood productions as a backdrop for lots of movies, some of which you've probably seen over the years. The town that epitomizes small America's daily life has long since moved past its industrial days and has become known for something else. On the outskirts of the town lies an old two-story Victorian home that has become famous over the recent years both among locals as well as across the country, with some saying it could be the most haunted place in the United States, if not the world. This is a bold statement to say the least, but the countless visitors to the house have reported strange, disturbing, and unexplainable encounters within its antique walls. But just how did the story begin? Where did the legend of the Belair House originate from? Let us first take a look at the home's dark history. Built in 1887 by a coal tycoon named Jacob Hetherington, the house sits adjacent from ancient Native American burial caves. It is also located where the scene of a massacre took place during the French and Indian War. It would sit on top of an active coal mine for years before. There was a major explosion that took place within the mine, killing multiple men working deep within the earth 
directly underneath the house. Could the culmination of these tragic deaths have opened up a portal within the Bel Air house? A portal that allowed something to come through that wasn't supposed to be here. Shortly after this explosion is when the strange activity began. Jacob's son Alex moved into the home with his daughter Lyde, but was soon stricken with seizures and hallucinations. He would ultimately be committed to an insane asylum for the rest of his life, claiming that demons were trying to kill him. As time progressed, Lyde would take charge of the family business, being helped by her younger brother Edwin. Lyde would tragically and unexpectedly pass away one morning in the kitchen of the home. Edwin, now alone and grief-stricken, descended into mysticism and the occult in search of answers. He began to regularly host seances in the kitchen where his sister had passed away to attempt to make contact with her on the other side, and it is believed that contact was indeed made but with who or what is uncertain. In 2005, Kristen Lee and her family are desperate for a new home. Like a curse, for the second time in less than two years, a flash flood has destroyed their home and all of their possessions. Kristen, her two sons, Nicholas and Lane, along with their father, Hefe, have been fortunate enough to room with friends during this difficult time. Kristen has continued to try and get the family back on their feet and no longer wants to burden her friends with the boarding of her family. So she constantly checks the real estate listings, hoping to find a home that her and her family can finally settle down into. Given the circumstances, the family didn't have a big budget and would have to rebuild their lives from scratch. But soon, her determination seems to pay off. While at work, Kristen often browses real estate websites for new listings as well as foreclosures, and a new listing soon catches her eye. Recently foreclosed on, but now available for purchase, she lays eyes on the old Victorian home for the first time. Its four bedrooms and two bathroom setup, along with plenty of room, would be perfect for her family. The price seems almost too good to be true for her budget as well. And although the listing lacks more details, it's like her prayers had finally been answered. But by what? Not wanting to lose the property, Kristen arranges a showing of the home as soon as possible, and before too long finds herself on the front steps of the Belair house. She is immediately taken in by the beautiful craftsmanship of the woodwork. The wraparound porch facing the Ohio River soon has her imagining peaceful evenings watching the water flow. Upon entering the home, she continues to be impressed. Old marble and cherry wood ordain the interior of the home, and it seems almost too perfect, like something straight out of her dreams. The family also has a dog named Bella, and the large fenced-in backyard is perfect for her to run in and the boys to play in. Dumbfounded by her luck, Kristen puts in an offer on the house that evening, and it's accepted the following morning. After two years of chaos and uncertainty, the Lee family can finally breathe again and start living a normal life. But just as all seems quiet and settled, the family begins to discover that the house is anything but normal. At first, upon hearing odd noises in the night, the family wrote off the sounds as nothing more than anxiety in an old house. Being slightly scared or anxious upon moving into a new place, particularly following a very uncertain time in one's life, is not out of the ordinary, but these sounds soon become too much to dismiss. They soon begin to hear footsteps at all hours of the day and night. Kristen would later describe the activity as so. I would hear footsteps above and sometimes below me, even when there was no one else home but me, and I always felt as if there were thousands of eyes staring at me, at all times, 
watching my every move. Along with the strange noises, items soon began to go missing. From keys to towels to trinkets, one moment they would be there, and within seconds, they would vanish. And Kristen isn't the only one experiencing strange happenings within the Belair house. At the time, her 12-year-old son Nicholas begins to experience a malevolent force that seems to dwell within his bedroom. At first, he too begins to feel as if he's being watched at all times, and it seems to get exponentially worse at night. He begins to have night terrors, feeling someone or something covering his mouth and nose, forcing him to suffocate. One night, he wakes up in a cold sweat. It's storming outside. Flashes of lightning occasionally light up the room. What he sees disturbs him to his core. In the corner of his room, towards his closet, as a burst of light fills the room, he sees a blackened figure staring at him and shaking profusely. The young boy is utterly terrified. Rushing out of his room as fast as he possibly can, he wakes up his mother and refuses to sleep there any longer. The boy is so hysterical, the only solution was to send him to his grandmother's house, located 30 minutes away. What makes this case all the more compelling is that Kristen has a master's degree in psychology and works as a mental health physician. With this, her professional opinion of what Nicholas had experienced was initially contributed to stress and fatigue, both common factors that tend to make the human mind see and experience things that aren't really there. And these probably could explain many similar situations, and most would agree. However, Kristen's view would soon undergo a radical change after one terrifying experience of her own. After months of strange happenings within the home, it was now winter and the Lee family, still tied on finances, was sleeping in the basement near the fireplace to save money on the gas bill. Hefe was asleep in a recliner and Lane as well as Kristen were asleep on the wraparound couch located in the corner of the room. All seemed normal until Kristen was woken up by the feeling of the couch cushion being pressed down near her legs. She then found herself face to face with a terrifying figure of a man staring directly at her. She would later describe the encounter as so. I woke up being face to face with this gray figure of a man. He was translucent, almost like a mist, but the mist had features like a person. The face was completely emotionless and had dark sunken in eyes. Kristen asked, who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? But to no response, just a blank, lifeless stare. Within seconds, the apparition disappears. But before she can ponder what had just taken place, the silence is once again shattered. But by this time, it was the family dog, Bella, who was barking and running around the room. Kristen, attempting to keep her family asleep through the ordeal, tries to quiet the dog down and notices that she can see her breath in the air. And although it's cold outside, it's not nearly that cold near the fireplace. She then sees the figure materialize once more and silently move from one side of the room and through the wall on the other side, vanishing completely. No longer wanting to face whatever this was alone, she woke up her husband and told him what had just taken place. His response, however, was that she was too tired and needed to go back to sleep. Could what Kristen had experienced been a stress or fatigue-induced hallucination? Perhaps, but someone with a professional background such as herself surely would know how to differentiate, wouldn't you think? Finally knowing she's not crazy and totally convinced that the home was haunted, Kristen begins to try and make plans to get her family out of the Bel Air house and to safety elsewhere. 
As soon as she can, she puts the home up for sale and moves the family to a nearby rental home. Although she's relieved to no longer physically be in the house, no one is buying it. To try and cover expenses, she has no other choice other than to make the house a rental property. But almost as soon as the first family moves in, they move out. And this kickstarts a revolving door of tenants. Seemingly stuck with the house, Kristen comes to the conclusion that no family will or should live there. So what should be done with the haunted property? Needing to make ends meet, she comes up with a unique idea. She turns the home into an afterlife research property. This would allow various groups to come in and conduct their own research on just what exactly was taking place within the Belair house. And the idea works. Soon, groups from all over the United States and Canada are traveling to temporarily live within the home to conduct research. And from here, we gain some more interesting stories, to say the least. One group, who calls themselves the Armchair Researchers, from upstate New York, consists of two women, one being a birthing nurse, and the other a nurse who works with dying patients. They found paranormal and afterlife research to be a natural extension of their day jobs for the last 15 years. After hearing about the Bel Air house, they soon find themselves driving to Ohio to investigate the phenomena for themselves. First impressions tend to go a long way, and the first impression the women got upon their arrival was very creepy. The home by this point was in a moderate state of decay. The fence that had once surrounded the backyard was mostly blown down, and the exterior of the home, as well as the porch, was weathered and rotting. But despite the odd feelings initially, they make their way inside, and at first, they actually felt welcomed, almost invited in, greeted by the same cherry wood interior that has greeted everyone. But as soon as they set up their equipment and prepare for their stay, as day turns to night, there seems to be a shift in energy within the home. The shift went from warm and inviting to dark and ominous. Then began the noises, banging, footsteps, and the moving of furniture. The ladies also noted the feeling of being watched everywhere they went. While asking probing questions as they wandered throughout the house, they would soon also witness strange lights in various parts of the home. And along with the lights, there soon also came full-blown apparitions, all of which seemed to be centered around the basement. And as the night progressed, so did their feelings of anxiety. While taking a short break and sitting down on one of the couches in the basement, the two heard what they described as a large crashing noise above them, as if someone or something had thrown a bookshelf across the house itself, shaking the entire home. Absolutely terrified and panicked, the women apprehensively made their way up the stairs and rushed out of the home as fast as they possibly could, leaving behind equipment and personal items. They were too frightened to go back. Upon learning of what had taken place, Kristen wasn't at all surprised. Over the years, there had been dozens of teams of people who couldn't seem to last the night for one experience or another. People have been scratched, pushed downstairs, punched, bitten, and even in one instance, thrown across the room by a violent and unseen force. Another noteworthy story comes from a team located locally there in Ohio. They have had the opportunity to visit the home and conduct investigations numerous times over the years. But their experience in particular one night truly makes me question just what exactly haunts the Bel Air house. There was three of them this time, and it was shortly after midnight when they made their way into the attic to continue their investigation. During their questioning, they seemed to be getting direct interaction with something through their spirit box. Then, towards the corner of the attic, a mist seemed to materialize, 
coming up from the attic floor, slowly enveloping the group. Glancing down, they were now too stunned to speak. They saw what appeared to be thousands of black snake-like creatures slithering over their feet and onto their legs. The creatures then began to form a figure standing in front of one of the attic windows, a creature of pure darkness that seemed to stare at them with thousands of tiny, beady eyes. The crew, which consisted of two men and a woman, ran for their lives, descending the attic stairs as quickly as possible, leaving behind anything and everything that they had brought with them that wasn't located on their person and out of the home for good. All of these stories and experiences have led many to believe that the Bel Air house is some kind of magnet for paranormal activity, a magnet or a host to a portal for spirits. Whether that portal was opened by the tragedy that took place within the mind that once existed below its foundation, or one that was opened due to seances being conducted within the house on multiple occasions. But over the years, many different entities have been documented from what appear to be human ghosts to perhaps something more sinister. One such entity goes by the name of Emily Davis. It is believed that Emily Davis was a child that drowned in the Ohio River that flows right by the home. Her room is allegedly the same room that Kristen's son Nicholas once stayed in. And besides the basement, it also seems to be a hot spot for paranormal activity. Through various investigations, once contact has been made and trust seems to be gained, people are often attacked, which have led many to believe that Emily isn't a child at all, but a demon. Perhaps it could be the same demonic creature that frightened Nicholas so bad that he moved out of the home, as previously mentioned. Many investigators also have claimed to have some activity follow them home, and even haunt their dreams, as if the house or the beings within the house are calling out to them to come back for one reason or another. Although many questions may never be answered surrounding the Bel Air house, one thing is for certain. It continues to be considered one of the most haunted places in America, if not the world. It also continues to serve as a place of study for those wanting to investigate the supernatural forces that dwell within its walls. But if you find yourself being drawn to the old Victorian, just know that if you're not careful, you too could find yourself being made a part of its history, whether you like it or not. Demonic Possession A phenomenon that's mostly written off in the modern day by the average person. But what happens when respected professionals see and experience things that convince them otherwise? Could we consider the possibility that demonic possession could indeed be real. I want you to keep that question in mind throughout this video and let me know what you think down in the comments below. Today, we will be discussing one such man whose experiences altered his skeptical view, and it all began 25 years ago when he met a woman named Julia. Dr. Richard Gallagher a Princeton and Yale-educated psychiatrist who runs his own practice and teaches at Columbia and New York universities, started out skeptical. Twenty-five years ago, due to his profession and skepticism, he began to be asked to provide medical oversight as a doctor of psychology to cases from different churches of different faiths, cases which the churches believed the individuals to be potentially genuinely possessed. Several cases in particular altered his views forever. A member of the local Catholic clergy approached Dr. Gallagher and asked him if he would provide his medical opinion on a case he was working on. Word had gotten out that Dr. Gallagher was both a great doctor as well as a skeptic, to which the priest commented, We understand that you're skeptical, 
and this is part of the reason as to why we want to use you. Gallagher accepted and made an arrangement to meet the woman and to begin her examination. The woman was claiming to be assaulted by forces she couldn't see, invisible monsters, if you will. This woman was known for being kind and rational, a devoutly religious Hispanic woman who had no history of mental illness. She described the episodes where she said she experienced an evil force that would overtake her and would subsequently beat her. The beatings, however, were not in her mind. Bruises would materialize on the woman's body, seemingly out of nowhere. And during the examination, Dr. Gallagher saw this happen for himself, and after several days, he came to the conclusion that not only was the woman completely sane, not even showing the slightest indication of mental illness, but that he believed what she was experiencing was genuine. From this strange case, the doctor continued to assist with providing psychiatric expertise and came to the conclusion that the vast majority of the cases turn out not to be true demonic possession, and only about 1 in 100 cases could even be considered anything of the sort. The doctor's examinations were very thorough. He not only physically and psychologically examined the persons, but would also interview any and all family and friends who were aware of the situation as to understand the story as a whole. And out of those 1 out of 100 cases that didn't fit into any known psychological pattern, supernatural characteristics would manifest. The persons who he believed were genuinely possessed would often display frightening behavior, such as the person speaking in languages that they couldn't have possibly known, exhibiting extreme strength with no known physical cause, claiming to move objects around the room without touching them, and displaying unknown knowledge about people, places, and things that no human being could possibly know. And we'll get into that more later in this video. The Catholic Church also has a strict deterministic criteria for possession as well. The case has to be confirmed via moral certainty, and under moral certainty, a person has to enter a trance-like state, and a demonic-sounding voice must manifest. The person then attacks religion, and attacks the people conducting the exorcism, as well as displaying demonic manifestations of power, such as those that Dr. Gallagher mentioned. In these severe and extremely rare cases, Dr. Gallagher would give his go-ahead for the exorcisms to proceed. The second case that would change his outlook forever was that of a woman named Julia. He was approached by two of America's leading Catholic exorcists to consult on a case that they believed to be one of the most severe demonic possessions they had ever witnessed. Julia was a 39-year-old woman who was a self-professed high priestess of a satanic cult. The night before Dr. Gallagher was supposed to go and meet Julia for the first time to begin examining her, he was in his study with his wife at about 3 a.m. Accompanying the couple was their two cats, and quoting the doctor here, seemingly out of nowhere, the cats began to go completely berserk, berserk in a way which we had never seen before we were mystified. The next morning upon his arrival, the priest introduced him to Julia for the first time, and the first words out of her mouth were, Hey Doc, how did you like those cats last night? Bewildered, the doctor continued his examination. As the day continued, she began to reveal other secrets that no human could possibly know such as how some of the doctor's patients had died, as well as their names, and dates and times of death. Another bizarre example of this secret knowledge, to quote him again, she told me when and how my mother had died, and that she had died from ovarian cancer, which was true. The following night, Dr. Gallagher was on the phone with one of the priests who was in charge of the exorcism, discussing the case. Julia was not on the line whatsoever, and as a matter of fact, they knew where she was. She was over a thousand miles away, and during their discussion, 
The same exact voice that had come out of Julia interrupted their phone call. The voice stated that she was theirs and to cease their efforts at once. Both disturbed and amazed, Dr. Gallagher said to the priest, Did you hear that? And the priest replied, Oh yes, the evil spirit can even interrupt our phone conversation. What makes this all a little bit more weird is that this conversation was also taking place on a landline, and landlines aren't particularly known for picking up any interference like a cell phone would. The doctor conducted further examinations as to not leave any medical possibility out of the equation. And during these examinations, Julia was witness speaking multiple languages she couldn't have possibly known, such as fluent Latin and Spanish. She was also witnessed levitating up and out of a chair she was placed in, and had to be brought back down and secured to the chair as to not hit the ceiling above. Running through all possibilities and witnessing the unexplained, the doctor drew only one sensible conclusion, that Julia was most definitely possessed. It's unfortunate that the fate of Julia and her exorcism are uncertain, or at least I couldn't find any more information about the case, although I'm definitely interested in what happened. After being a consultant for over 20 years, Dr. Richard Gallagher also had some interesting things to say in regards to the possessed themselves. He said that one does not simply wake up possessed. These people have turned to evil in a very explicit way. In the case of Julia, for example, she had blatantly turned to Satanism and had invited darkness into her life. The same can be said for all the rest. They had somehow, some way, invited evil into their lives. He also had something to say about skeptics as well. He said that people who are critical of possession often require a ridiculous amount of proof. They have to understand that these things cannot be reproduced in a lab environment, and most of them have never seen a genuine case, let alone spoken to an exorcist. And I don't think that's very scientific of them. They say that one man's trash is another man's treasure. While many people accidentally purchase a haunted home without knowing it was haunted, this story partially is about a man who did the opposite. But the home in which he purchased was way more than he bargained for. Not for him, but for a family whose experiences made it infamous. With a one-of-a-kind strange past and a present-day nasty and demonic reputation. Known as Pennsylvania's Amityville Horror, this is the untold story of the Wells House and why it's considered one of the most haunted places in the state, let alone the country. To properly tell this story, we must first start at the beginning. The notorious home on Wells Street was built by industrialist Augustus C. Laning, but despite his future success, Laning had not led such an easy life. After arriving in the Wilkes-Barre area to work for his grandfather at age 14, he would soon experience tragedy. His younger nephew shortly after his arrival would pass away when the barn he was playing in was struck by lightning and caught fire, trapping him inside. Shortly after this happening, one of his grandfather's factories would also mysteriously catch fire and burn to the ground as well. Despite a series of unfortunate events, the Laning's enterprises would eventually thrive, allowing Augustus to inherit land from his mother on what is today Well Street. Eventually, he would build a home at 46 South Well Street in 1861 and lived there until 1865, when he eventually sold his home and business. He would take his last breath in 1875. The land in which Laning built the home on, as many locals would say, was soaked in turmoil and blood, having been the site of numerous wars and conflicts between Native American tribes, as well as European settlers and Native tribes. From the late 19th century to the mid-20th century, 
the house went through a series of sheriff sales, which were a type of public auction, and would eventually sell for just one dollar at auction in May of 1939, a little over twenty dollars in today's money. Although tragedy befell the Laning family, especially early on in Augustus's life, any happenings within the home weren't documented if they did occur. As far as we know, no death had taken place up until this time, but it certainly starts to snowball as the years progress. In 1940, the person who had purchased the home so cheaply at auction would breathe their last breath by their own hand, as would the next person who purchased the home via auction in 1950, almost exactly 10 years apart to the day. After these mysterious deaths, there would be four more that would take place on the premises. The other three I was unable to dig up additional details on. However, the most notable was the fourth, a priest who was 54 years old and in relatively good health, had been walking past the home in passing. When he glanced at the home, we don't know exactly what he saw or experienced, but he fell to the ground and died almost instantly from a heart attack right in the front yard. The home would be a revolving door for quite some time, sometimes vacant, sometimes with occupants, but only for a short time. In March of 1975, a 27-year-old radio DJ by the name of Walker Bennett and his wife Mary Ann purchased the home and then moved into the house from New Haven with their two daughters. Almost as soon as they moved into the house, bizarre activity began to manifest. The family began to hear banging and scratching sounds coming from inside the walls. Thinking at first they had some kind of a rodent problem, Walker followed the noise and traced it back to a particular bedroom wall. He then knocked the wall down, but instead of being greeted by this supposed rodent problem, he instead saw a small, glimmering tin box instead. After removing the box, he felt a strange presence. Upon opening it, its contents were very weird to say the least. It contained a red ribbon, a cross made of tied together chicken bones, and a human molar. The first thing that struck him was that this looked like some kind of a hex or curse, but not wanting to alarm his family, he would dispose of the items, but the activity nonetheless would continue to persist. By 1976, the scratching and knocking had continued, but soon the family began to see otherworldly beings as well. On one particularly cold February morning, Bennett would hear a series of bangs and scratches on his front door. Upon slowly opening it to see just who was there, he would be shocked. Standing at the front door was the translucent figure of a man with a cane with a vicious and crooked smile. Freaked out with his heart racing, he quickly slammed the door and tried to make sense of the interaction. Within seconds, he reopened the door, only to find that there was nothing there. As the days ticked by, the activity intensified. The scratches and banging noises now seemed to be originating from the attic. They now were also joined by disembodied screams, some seeming to be male, others female, and some were a mix of both. In the months to come, the activity would be coupled with moaning and groaning sounds, whispering voices, and the sounds of weeping coming from inside the walls all still tracing back to the attic. Coupled with these new developments were the sounds of heavy footsteps on the wooden floors. The entire family would also see several apparitions. Notably, they would experience the ghostly figure of a young woman in a nightdress drifting throughout the house. Her dress seemed to be old, like those of the Victorian era. Whenever she was seen following her, would be drips or spots of blood, either on the floor or on the walls. Once she began to be seen 
there was a putrid, rotting type of stench that became present in the house, traveling from room to room. It was, however, usually the worst in the kitchen and living room. Not wanting to further frighten the girls, the Bennets met with each other to discuss all of the bizarre happenings, and they finally had to admit that they had purchased a haunted house. Haunted by what exactly? They couldn't be sure. Shortly after this revelation, the family began to suffer from an unexplainable physical illness, one that left them drained at all times, exhausted and aching. The doctors couldn't diagnose it, leaving the family only to continue to suffer with the symptoms. Alongside this, whether it was a result of the illness on an individual basis or the haunting itself, the whole family seemed to be thrown into a deep, dark well of depression, submerged in its black waters, leaving them feeling hopeless. Things would begin to escalate further when in January of 1977, Walker and his wife would witness one of their daughters be pushed down the stairs. But to their amazement, she didn't fall and crumple on the various steps. Instead, she floated, almost in slow motion, until she landed on her feet at the bottom of them, unharmed. Not knowing what to make of this, the adults in the house weren't getting much sleep, and their condition continued to get worse. They would soon reach out to the church for help and guidance. Soon a Catholic priest would come out and bless the home, trying to quell whatever supernatural forces that were wreaking havoc upon the Bennets. But these efforts were to no avail. If anything, after he left, the activity seemed to get worse. Ultimately, in March of 1978, the family who had been sound asleep in the night was woken up by the sound of thunder crashing, except there wasn't a storm outside. What followed this massive sound was a deluge of paranormal manifestations. Footsteps were pounding across the floor and in the attic above them. The attic door was being pounded on from the other side. Their dishes in their kitchen were being removed from their cabinets as they opened and slammed by themselves and thrown onto the floor, shattering them. Amongst the chaos was the scratching and banging on the front door, coupled with the sounds of a child weeping, coming from inside of the walls, following them as they ran throughout the house. After enduring almost three years inside the home, the Bennets finally fled this night, leaving with just the clothes on their backs. They left all of their belongings behind. After the family found temporary arrangements, they immediately tried to sell the home as it was, but had no luck finding a buyer. After several months, Walker Bennett reached out to a local newspaper in hopes of sharing the family's story anonymously to find help or a buyer to get them out of this haunted hell. In the interview under the pseudonym of Bucky Johnson, he claimed that he was now $40,000 in debt as a result of the family fleeing and being unable to live in the house and then being unable to sell the house and that he had developed a drinking problem and now chain smoked as a result of the trauma and stress that he had endured. He also stated that he and the rest of the family were in therapy in hopes of eventually putting the past behind them. Several neighbors near the home were also interviewed, with some saying that they had never seen or heard anything, and others saying that they always had an odd feeling whenever passing by the house. The article was then published on Halloween of 1979, perfect timing for a local and terrifying story, no doubt. Following the initial publicity, word eventually made its way to Ed and Lorraine Warren, famed paranormal investigators and demonologists who had just covered another haunting known as the Amityville Horror just three years before. The couple made a visit to the Wells Street house in March of 1980, but by this time, the bank had repossessed the home from the Bennets 
due to their inability to make further mortgage payments on the home. So the Warrens were unable to enter the house due to it being entirely locked up for this reason. Lorraine, however, would say that she sensed a terrible despair emanating from the house and that the effect it must have had on those who lived there must have been very negative. Several years later, the house would be purchased by a woman named Catherine Watkins from the bank for $20,000 in August of 1982. Her purchase subsequently prompted another newspaper article to be written. When asked, she told reporters that she was unafraid of the rumors surrounding the house and didn't fear any ghosts that could be there. She moved in with her two children shortly after her purchase. And whether it was sheer determination, stubborn nature, or something else, she lived in the house for the next 30 years until her death on October 26th of 2012. Although shortly after moving in, and over the decades to come, she and her family also experienced unexplained phenomena, such as objects moving by themselves, their beds shaking, lights and appliances turning on and off by themselves, and seeing those ghosts that Catherine insisted she wasn't afraid of, such as the woman in what looked like Victorian-style clothing. Her daughter would inherit the home after Catherine's passing, and would place the home up for sale, where it was then purchased by a ghost hunter by the name of Tim Woods in December of 2013. Rather than repair, sell, or live in the property he had just purchased, Woods only wanted to investigate the paranormal activity that was taking place there. With his team of fellow investigators, they would record hours of content in the home and capture what they believed to be numerous supernatural manifestations. People who have joined him in the investigations have been known to have scratches manifest on their skin and have their clothing tugged on by unseen hands. Tim would later state that the Wells house is one of the scariest haunted locations that he had ever investigated due to the numerous ghost sightings that were caught on tape and demonic attacks that occurred while he was there. He said, It is our conclusion based upon our documented research that the house is haunted by a demonic presence that cannot be removed, nor is it safe for anyone to live in. The strangeness of the house on Wells Street doesn't end here. In the early hours of Wednesday, July 25th of 2018, police were called to the home to catch an intruder. Someone was outside of the house, trying to get in. When authorities arrived, they apprehended a man in his 30s. He was caught in the act of prying the wooden boards off the back door of the property. He had a 24-inch sword tied to his back, had brass knuckles and a pocket knife in his pockets, and was carrying a Bible. The man seemed out of it to say the least, but claimed that he was trying to hunt for ghosts. Upon going through his rub sack, police also found a loaded shotgun with 10 shells alongside of it. He would be arrested and charged with numerous offenses as a result of the episode. Although we don't know who, it seems that the home was sold in 2020 to new owners and at half the price that Woods had paid for it. There also doesn't appear to be any sort of a mention of it being haunted. Its listing reads like this. A home full of historical intrigue. With some TLC, you can bring new life to this four-bedroom beauty. As soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there is truly something out of this world with this home and its craftsmanship. A very fitting spin, if you ask me. I hope the new occupants are living peacefully, although given the home's infamous story and past, seems highly unlikely. But the listing was right about one thing, though. The home certainly has lots of historical intrigue. And you can bring new life into this four-bedroom beauty. Because as soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there's truly something out of this world with this home. Or should we say, in this home, that's been watching and waiting for some new life to engorge itself on.
There was once a place where the dead whispered, where buried secrets lie dormant for generations, only to unleash a horrific evil once they were unearthed. This is the story about a family who endured a living nightmare in what was supposed to be their dream home. This is the untold story of the Summerwind Mansion and the hell that dwelled within its walls. The home that would become known as Summerwind was originally built in northern Wisconsin in 1916 by then U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Robert Lamont. Originally called the Lamont Mansion after it was finished, it sat upon 80 acres of property. Alongside the large home, which contained three large chimneys, guest quarters, and a large basement, sat another smaller building, which is where the servants lived. And from the beginning, things just didn't seem quite right. The mansion was fairly isolated, especially given the time period. The road conditions were poor at best, and the area in which it was in receives heavy snowfall throughout various times of the year, which led to most of the winters being waited out among the estate. During the first long winter at the property, the servants were soon being tormented by what they described as a translucent woman, first seeing her staring at them from the main window of their quarters, from the courtyard, to her then beginning to materialize within the home itself. Mr. Lamont initially dismissed these claims as nothing more than paranoia, thinking his servants were either delusional or getting stir-crazy given the weather, and this was until one cold evening when he was made a true believer. While he and his wife were enjoying their dinner together on the first floor, they were interrupted by the basement door shaking violently. Terrified, knowing that there was no one who could be down there, Mr. Lamont, pistol in hand, went to investigate. The shaking door abruptly stopped as Lamont came within several feet of it. Fighting through nerves and anxiety, Mr. Lamont threw the door open expecting there to be someone there. Instead, he was met with a bone-chilling silence. He was even more unnerved after sweeping the basement and further confirming that there was indeed no one there. Afterwards, he began to make his way back towards the door to head back upstairs, when suddenly, the ghostly form of a man appeared and stepped right in front of the exit. Scared out of his mind, Lamont then fired two shots from his pistol, and the apparition then disappeared. When others were sent to investigate to confirm that there indeed was no one there, all they found were fresh bullet holes. And after this incident, the Lamont family abandoned the property, never to return. It then sat vacant and rotting for decades. The mansion was still owned by the Lamont family, until Mr. Lamont's death in 1948, when it was then sold. It exchanged hands several times until it came into the possession of Mr. and Mrs. Kiefer. The Kiefer family believed that they had found their forever home and were more than excited to move in. But this honeymoon feeling was all too short-lived. The Kiefer soon began to experience strange things within the house. Unexplained sounds like banging that traveled all throughout the home at random times of the day and night. Glimpses of shadows out of the corner of their eyes, and the feeling as if they were being watched at all times. These experiences soon led the family to their breaking point, and they too would abandon the mansion, leaving behind all of their belongings, food, clothes, and furniture. Mrs. Kiefer would later state that she believed if she took anything with her from that house, that something horrible would happen to them. And although it was still owned by the Kiefer family, the estate yet again sat rotting away for years to come. And not only that, but word of just why it had been abandoned had reached the local community as well, leading to it being called the Old Haunted House. The Kiefer family, despite their unfortunate experiences, would end up being the lucky ones. 
1969, Ginger Henshaw was visiting a friend and was told that she had to visit the old haunted house with her. Intrigued, she agreed and soon found herself approaching in a car, catching her first fleeting glimpses of summer wind through fingerprint speckled window glass. She would later say that upon seeing the home, she felt sorry for it. She felt that it was calling out to her soul, crying out to her soul, for her to save it. She almost immediately became obsessed with the idea of living there. Her husband, Arnold, owned a construction company, and shortly after her initial trip with her friend, would also take a trip there with his wife, to see just what all her excitement was about. Knowing what it would take, Arnold immediately saw the potential and agreed that it may just be the perfect investment for the family. Since they were used to moving due to the nature of Arnold's business, the couples also figured they could use the space for their six children, as well as themselves. They then were able to reach out to the Kiefers and make them an offer that they couldn't refuse for this massive fixer-upper. First impressions certainly go a long way for most people, and not everyone will get the same impression either. Contrary to her parents' impressions of Summerwind, nine-year-old April got a much different feeling altogether, one of unease and fear. She described Summerwind as a huge, dingy, and decrepit place, and that she was immediately overcame with a feeling of dread, like she didn't belong there. Children can often be scared by new experiences, but given what was about to unfold, I don't think that was the case for young April. Within weeks, the family moves in. Ginger immediately becomes obsessed with restoring the old home. So much so, it was like she was being compelled by an unseen force. Some of this work included trying 11 different paint colors to match the woodwork. It was as if she had been given an assignment to restore this relic back to its original glory. And as Ginger fixated on renovating, her husband Arnold began to lose interest in the house and grew ever more distant from his family. He began to wander aimlessly in a state of confusion, starting things and stopping them just as quickly. He seemed to hyper-focus on the old organ that had come with the home and began to play it at all hours of the night. Along with this, he began to be tormented by something that he couldn't see, and he believed that if he stopped playing, something horrible would happen to him. Meanwhile, Ginger continued her work. As the days continued to tick by, slowly but surely, the family began to experience very strange activity within the home. This began with small items often being misplaced when there was no one around to move them but this soon escalated to chairs being moved. One moment they'd be up against the dining table, and the next moment, up against the wall. And no matter what room you were in or what you were doing, you always felt as if you were being watched. Along with this omnipresent watcher, the family began to be awakened by disembodied crying at odd times during the night. The crying was described as something trying to mimic the crying of a baby but it just wasn't quite human, and there were no children that age residing within the home at the time. Footsteps also followed them wherever they went, and didn't stop when they reached them. They would often cascade onto the walls. They would also hear the walking above their heads, as if someone or something simply defied gravity and walked around and above them. Now several weeks into what was supposed to be their forever home, the Henshaw family was now experiencing activity not of this world. Arnold had also grown more distant, more reclusive, and was no longer acting like the sweet man that he had once been. His personality had completely shifted, and he was no longer himself. He had gone from a loving father to an insanely angry shell of his former self. His daughter April would later describe him like this. Any little thing would seem to set him off, and you would have to bear the brunt of his rage. These possession episodes only grew in intensity, and he became more and more evil. An example of this is that one day the family's pet raccoon escaped, 
sending Arnold into a frenzy. He attempted to force the children into the nearby woods to look for it. Amidst the altercation, thankfully their mother intervened and kept him from sending them there. As a punishment to the children, Arnold found and then killed the raccoon in front of them. Despite the radical changes that were taking place within her family and daily life, Ginger attempted to regain a sense of normalcy. Attempting to put the strange activity out of her mind, she hosted a dinner party with some friends who hadn't seen her or the family since they had moved into Summerwind. Things seemed to be going well, and that was until she made a quick trip to the kitchen to get some snacks for her guests who were sitting in the parlor. As she loaded a plate with food, the muted warmth of company was shattered by a scream. Ginger rushed to the room to find her guests screaming in terror as they witnessed the ghostly form of a man with a misshapen face appear directly in front of them. Within seconds, they rushed out of Summerwind and would never speak to Ginger ever again. Although what she had suspected all along, Ginger's worst fears were now confirmed. She was dealing with something not of this realm. And even though she knows she's not insane, it's of little consolation. Arnold has continued to spiral deeper into madness. His playing on the old organ has now become more frequent than ever and has grown more dissident and demonic in tonality. Within two months, Arnold has gone completely berserk and has lost all grip of reality. He's lost his construction business because he simply stopped working and all of the family's assets are depleted, having purchased and renovated the home. And now, he's on the verge of losing his family. His daughters, now ages 8 and 10, believe that the house is what is destroying their family. They have both contemplated suicide, a horrific absolute for anyone, but it's particularly disturbing because of their young ages. Ginger now often seeks refuge in the nearby woods, choosing to sleep on the forest floor rather than in her own home, because she's grown so terrified of what inhabits the property. But this time, winter is quickly approaching. Due to the lack of income, the gas and electricity to the home have now been shut off, and the family's daily life has devolved into basic survival needs. A broken water pump now forces them to also have to haul water from the nearby lake. Along with continuing to deal with Arnold's insanity and the paranormal activity, they are struggling just to stay warm. They've now moved all of their mattresses into the living room around the fireplace and have resorted to burning the furniture, no matter how expensive, just to live. While stripping part of the woodwork in her room to use as firewood, April was met with a horrific discovery. Upon pulling a board back, she was greeted face to face with a human skeleton. Its gnarled teeth and empty eye sockets staring back at her, with small strands of hair still attached to the scalp. Isolated and traumatized, the Henshaws continue to barely exist. As the icy winds howl outside of the mansion, and although it's taken nearly everything going wrong, Ginger finally reaches her breaking point. Pride has kept her from calling her father, but Pride is slowly giving way to her fear. Fear for herself and her children's lives. So she finally does the right thing. Walking through the frozen woods, she makes her way to the closest neighbor's house and makes the call. And like a knight in shining armor, the following morning, Ginger and the girls are rescued. Arnold stays behind, but would leave Summerwind the following day to be committed to a mental hospital. Whatever hope him and Ginger once had for their relationship has long since been shattered. He was never seen or heard from by the family again. The home would be foreclosed on and resold to a new owner. But just when they thought the war was over, a new chapter was just beginning.
In later interviews, Ginger would state that she wasn't into haunted houses or the spiritual world, but after what she experienced at Summerwind, she felt that she had to discover and learn about it to make sense of what had happened to her. Upon being rescued by her father, Ray, Ginger told him everything, every last detail of what had taken place. However, her father didn't believe her. He didn't doubt that there had been dysfunction and breakdown within her marriage, but he did doubt that the paranormal had anything to do with it. The year is now 1972, and Ginger and the girls are now living with Ginger's father in Ontario, Canada. Ginger has become an avid student of the paranormal, reading every last book that she can get her hands on to try and decipher just what happened at Summerwind. Since her time there, she's vowed to never return under any circumstances. But to the contrary, her father cannot seem to get the place out of his mind. And without her knowledge, he arranges a meeting and a showing of the mansion with the new owner, a woman named Mrs. Murray. Since purchasing the home, she's been unable to sell it and refuses to go inside due to a personal experience she never spoke about. Upon the arrangement, Ray and his son, Ray Jr., go inside. Ray Jr. has just been discharged from the army after several tours in Vietnam during the war and needs something to help keep him busy and help him adjust back to civilian life. Upon seeing Summerwind, like his father, he is also immediately drawn to it, describing it as the most fascinating home he's ever seen, like a mix of all different styles of architecture, and that the home looked like it needed someone to care for it, like a puppy in the rain. Both men make their way inside, and it isn't long until they feel like the home is watching them. But despite a mysterious chill in the air, Ray decides to make the purchase. But like his daughter before him, he too will soon discover that he's purchased more than what he could have ever bargained for. Ray Jr. quickly gets to work renovating the old home. He calls multiple contractors to try and get assistance with the work. But as soon as they would find out where the work was to be done, they would stop returning his calls. So Ray continued alone. One day, shortly after his work had began, Ray was frightened by something. He was so frightened that he refused to return to the mansion and claimed that he broke all of his tools, but not yet telling his father about what had happened. Ray Sr. continued to be excited about his plans for Summerwind. As he was explaining his layout plan with his daughter and son, Ray Jr. seemed particularly nervous and kept biting his nails. Having also now studied hypnotism, Ginger offered to help her brother with his nail biting by placing him in a trance. However, things soon escalated. The lights began to flicker, and the same mysterious icy wind began to chill the entire room. And Ray no longer sounded like himself. The voice of an old gruff man now answered Ginger, an old gruff voice that said, I am strong, and my children are weak. You are weak, and I am strong. I am very old, and have seven children, and I despise them all, for they are weak, and I am strong. Fearing that she had unleashed something she couldn't control, Ginger began to panic once the traditional methods weren't breaking Ray's trance. She commanded the spirit to leave his body and give her back her brother. And with those words, things returned to normal. Ray soon woke up, and besides a slight headache, had no memory of what had just occurred, much to everyone's shock. Ray Sr. was quick to dismiss the event as overactive imaginations. However, Ray Jr. had no children, and none of the statements he had made made any sense. The man's son then proceeded to explain to him what took place to him at Summerwind and why he refused to go back. He was alone in one of the hallways, sweeping, and he began to hear voices. Calling out to them, he began to walk towards them, where he believed where they were coming from. Then, he heard two distinct gunshots and smelled burning gunpowder. Having just come back from a tour in Vietnam, 
there was no mistaking that smell for the young veteran. He quickly ran into the kitchen where he continued to smell the scent. He then checked the perimeter. It had rained the night before, but there were no tracks besides his, which would have been impossible. As he continued to check, he saw the basement door where he had spotted two bullet holes, and although they looked extremely old, he continued to smell gunpowder and was rattled to his core. Upon turning around to face the room again, he was met by the apparition of an old man with a disfigured face. The spirit was racing towards him with hell in his eyes. Ray did the sensible thing and ran to the safety of his vehicle and left for good. Knowing his son was a staunch atheist and non-believer prior to this event, Ray Sr. was astonished. Given all the information and details both his daughter and son had now shared with him, along with his newfound obsession with the home, Ray now believed that there was some kind of force attempting to communicate with them. But about what exactly, he wasn't sure. Upon her father's request, and although it took much longer than anticipated, Ginger placed him in the same trance that she had placed her brother. During his hypnosis, Ray Sr. finds himself at summer when searching its halls. He then began to descend into the basement, where he discovered a box hidden behind some old stones in one of the walls. Upon opening the box, he sees a land grant written in 1767, signed by someone named Jonathan Carver. As the trance is broken, and as he re-enters conscious reality, Ray Sr., along with his family, are shocked that seemingly out of nowhere, they have conjured a name connected to Summerwind a name that could help them solve the elusive mysteries hiding within its walls. The family quickly gets to work. Heading to the local library, Ray Sr. finds that Jonathan Carver was an explorer in the late 1700s, whose crowning achievement was negotiating a peace settlement between two warring native tribes. As a reward for this, he was gifted a large swath of land, the same land in which Summerwind now sits. But upon his death, his children were unable to find any documents to verify this, and thus they were unable to inherit it. Could a land grant truly be sitting in a box hidden deep within the basement of the mansion? Although both Ginger and her brother had vowed to never step foot in Summerwind again, given these new revelations, they both believed that perhaps the spirits were attempting to tell them where this grant was. Perhaps they wanted it found, for one reason or another, so they could be at peace. For this reason, they agreed to go back. Although all were fearful, they made their way back into the old mansion, and from here, they headed to the basement to search. They quickly came upon the spot Ray Sr. had seen during his trance, and after pulling several stones out, there was a space behind them, just as Ray had seen. But shock and happiness soon turned to an abyss of disappointment. There was no box there, and after confirming that there was no box anywhere in the basement, they decided to do a deep search of the entire house, but a box was never recovered. Realizing just how much of an impact the entire Summerwind experience had had upon them, and how much time they had spent searching for answers to its elusive enigmas, they collectively decided to preserve what was left of their sanity. Seemingly tormenting every single person who had ever lived there, perhaps its secrets could never be solved. So the family gets in their vehicle and leaves Summerwind, never to return. The property would later be sold again and again. It would sit vacant for years. Then on one stormy night in 1988, Lightning strikes the old mansion multiple times, burning it to the ground, forever sealing its secrets within a tomb of ashes. Today, all that remains are the runes of its two chimneys and some stones. Carver's descendants, researchers, and others still to this day have not found the land deed. But the real question is, did it ever exist at all? Did the spirit of Carver pull any and all people he could to attempt to find it, or was he ever there?
at all? Or could there have been something else? Something that perhaps was never human stalking the grounds of Summerwind instead, causing the torment and madness to the many residents who dared to call the mansion their home. The truth for now will forever remain a mystery, it seems, but the reality of what happened to the Henshaw family will forever haunt them until the day that they die. Throughout history, it has been speculated that many have been plagued by an ancient demonic force. From Mesopotamia to more modern times, this evil and terrifying entity has said to enter our world and wreak havoc upon those who dwell within it. When a seemingly normal family disregards the warnings and partakes in multiple Ouija board sessions, what happened next nearly destroyed them. This is the untold story of the demonic Zozo House of Oklahoma and the abhorrent creature that stalks its walls. Oklahoma City, a small but growing city in the heartland of America, known for blue collar work and brick and mortar shops, red dirt, and sports would soon become known for something much darker. A teenager by the name of Darren Evans was growing up here, a normal boy by all accounts, doing things that any teenagers would enjoy, hanging out with friends, shenanigans here and there, and dating girls. He began dating a girl named Brandy who attended school with him and the two often found themselves visiting each other as often as they could, whether that was walking to and from school, in between classes, or visiting each other's homes. One day, while Brandy's home was having some plumbing work done on some pipes located underneath the house, the plumber doing the work would soon make a strange discovery. Located below the foundation of the home, covered in dirt, was an old Ouija board. The front letters were partially buried, and the back of the board was solid black in color. Off to the side of where the board was found was an aged planchette. What made this finding even more bizarre was that four old jars sat on the corners of the board speckled with dirt as well. Thinking perhaps the kids had stashed the board away and forgot about it, the worker told the young couple after his work was done about what he had found. And it's from here that things seemingly take a darker turn. Upon examining the discovery, they began to brush the dirt away from the jars. They were then shocked by what they found. Inside each one of the jars, sitting on the four corners of the board, were the decaying bodies of blackbirds, congealed blood and matter still present. Bewildered but intrigued, they sat the jars off to the side and picked up the board. As soon as his fingers made contact with the board, Darren seemed to have an instant connection with it. And with this, soon came a burning curiosity to examine it, and this curiosity would manifest into obsession. With this, the couple took the board inside the home where they spoke with Brandy's mother. She actively practiced the Wiccan religion, but had no idea who could have put the board there. Several days later, curious, as most teenagers are. Darren was an avid music fan, and one night, after building up the courage to do it, he decided he was going to contact the deceased singer of the popular band ACDC, a man named Ronald Belford Scott, using the board. 
Scott had passed away from alcohol poisoning in 1980. After lighting several candles, laying the board with letters facing towards him, and placing the planchette upon the board, he began his session. At first, nothing seemed to happen, but Darren was still feeling this otherworldly connection to something within the board itself. After trying for half an hour, to his shock and amazement, the planchette began to move. Slowly at first, it then frantically began to move by itself, moving from Z to O, Z to O, over and over and over again, spelling out the name Zozo. Shocked and unsure of what or who he had contacted, Darren said goodbye in an attempt to end the session. Before his eyes, he saw the planchette spell out, see you in hell, and then it threw itself across the room. A now terrified and bewildered Darren ran out of his room and tried to make sense of what had just taken place. But this was just the beginning of what was to come. It started with horrible night terrors. He would wake up unable to move or speak and would hear whispering in his ears. These episodes at night were soon followed by banging and knocking throughout his house during the daytime, as well as a constant feeling as if he was being watched by something he couldn't see. But despite the presence he was feeling, Darren now sought answers to his ever-growing list of questions, just what exactly he had uncovered. So, he continued to hold sessions with the board, for better or for worse. Darren would later quote this, The sessions now were as intense and paranormal as anything I have ever witnessed. A deep and terrible moaning could be heard emanating through the walls after these sessions. I developed sleep paralysis and became reclusive to society in general. I was once again messing with Zozo and Ouija boards, despite the terrors of my earlier sessions, in which I had promised myself I would never do it again. But again and again, I did. When not in use, the board was kept in a purple silk cloth and stored in his bedroom closet. It would also often go missing, sometimes for days on end. When checking back where he had placed it in order to set up and initiate a new session, the board would seemingly vanish, only to reappear at random times, as if it was the one calling the shots of when it could be seen and used. The years came and went, and the sessions on the mystical Ouija board continued. Darren, by this time, started inviting his friends to partake in the sessions, and although their sessions with him would prove he's not insane, it's of little consolation considering the tragedy they would seemingly manifest later on. Darren's best friend was a man by the name of Randy. The two had bonded over their love for the band ACDC in high school, and had been inseparable ever since. Randy's idol also being the late Bon Scott, whose lifestyle seemingly imprinted upon the youthful teens once upon a time, and perhaps would ultimately lead to the downfall of one of them. By now, Darren was living in his own apartment and working construction at a job site he was on. He would make a strange but familiar discovery. As he was digging down into the earth, he found what appeared to be a jar. Upon picking it up to discard it, he wiped away the dirt and debris, only to be shocked by its familiar contents. Lo and behold, within the jar was a congealed and rotting blackbird, extremely similar, if not identical, to the ones initially found alongside the Ouija board 
underneath his high school girlfriend's home all those years ago. It was particularly weird, not just because of this, but the fact that he had found it, digging down deep into the earth. He wondered, what were the odds of this? And although he had no way of knowing for sure, his gut began to tell him that there was some kind of witchcraft or occult expertise at play here. Perhaps someone or a group of people were knowingly contacting this entity known as Zozo, but for what remained to be known. One evening in 1985, Darren and Randy were relaxing at Darren's apartment when they decided to host a session on the Ouija board. Randy, more than anything, wanted to try and make contact with his late idol, Bon Scott. While wearing a Highway to Hell ACDC shirt, Randy's intent was clear. The two dimmed the lights, lit a couple of candles, and began the session upon the board. They made contact within a few minutes. Once the planchette was moving, Randy exclaimed, we want to talk to Bon Scott of ACDC. With this sentence, the planchette seemingly obliged. It moved in circles, eventually spelling out A-Y-E-M-A-T-E. The two looked at each other in amazement. The entity was using Australian dialects. And for anyone who doesn't know, Bon Scott was Australian. After several more questions, both of the young men were convinced they were speaking with their idol. The spirit seemed to know every little detail to any question they asked. And during the session, the entity then made a strange request from the men. It asked them to light a cigarette and place it in the hole in the planchette. What proceeded to make both of them laugh also made them quite spooked as well. So they lit a couple cigarettes, one for each of them, and one for this entity. They took a few drags to keep it lit, and then placed it cherry side up in the planchette hole. The planchette then spelled out thanks, and they then watched in utter amazement as the cherry of the cigarette lit up, as if Bon himself was taking puffs off of it. But this amusement was short-lived. Once the cigarette had seemingly been smoked, the planchette began to spell something very different. It spelled, F you, Randy. I will have your soul, and I'll see you in hell. Z-O. Z-O. Terrified, the men quickly ended the session by saying goodbye and tossing the board outside the second-story apartment balcony door. Clearly scared and upset, Randy also didn't take kindly to threats. He began cussing out Zozo with complete and utter rage. The board would later be returned by his downstairs neighbor. And after this session, a series of lows for both of the men seemed to manifest in the years to come. Influenced by the lifestyle of his idol, Randy fell victim to alcoholism. He soon would lose his wife to divorce and have split custody with his son. And although many opportunities presented themselves for Randy to better his life, for one reason or another, he was always just too far away to be able to grasp them. He often said to Darren, I feel like I'm in a prison and I can't escape. For old time's sake, the two did one last Ouija board session together in 2005, in which Randy asked the board how he would die. The board responded, in a car, at night, alone. In 2007, after spending the evening with Darren, the last words he would say to him were, Darren, I will see you in hell. The next morning, Darren received a phone call from Randy's girlfriend, Alicia, saying that Randy never made it home after he left. Instead, 
he had passed away in a violent head-on collision, ultimately passing away in a car at night and alone. This devastating passing, along with the frequent contact with the entity known as Zozo over the years, led to a fascination and borderline obsession with a search for answers for Darren Evans. During the time before and after Randy's death, he had been living in a home in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, that would become synonymous with the demon's name. It was here that the worst afflictions brought on by the entity would take place to him and his family. Darren's fascination with the occult led him to hanging on to and possessing multiple Ouija boards and other various occult objects. It was here that he began to study on a much more in-depth and organized basis, just trying to figure out who or what Zozo was. But this research would soon be interrupted. In this home lived himself, his wife Kathleen, and their young daughter at the time. During a session with his wife Kathleen one evening, while their daughter slept rooms away, Zozo would once again make itself present in their lives, but this time seemed to take possession of Darren. Kathleen trembled with fear and bated breath as something stared at her through Darren's eyes, something that clearly wasn't human. He then turned violent, attempting to attack her. Fortunately for Kathleen, she was able to say goodbye and get away before any harm could be done to her. Several minutes later, Darren would come back to himself with no memory of what had taken place. After this session, things seemed to escalate in intensity. Sounds began to wrap throughout the entire home, from knocking to hissing, footsteps and banging all seemingly with no explainable origin. The family got so terrified that they sectioned off a particular bedroom upstairs, calling it their safe room. One night, however, not everyone was within the safe room. Suddenly, an overwhelming sense of terror creeped upon Darren as he was trying to sleep. He rushed to the safe room to attempt to stop what he was feeling, but quickly realizing he couldn't leave his family behind, he rushed back out of the room in an attempt to gather them and bring them to safety as well. As he was heading towards the stairs, his daughter had heard his cries and was now at the foot of the stairs. It was here that Darren saw her being lifted by invisible hands into the air and carried away from him. Screaming for his child as she screamed for her father, Darren ran down the stairs as fast as he possibly could, but couldn't see her anywhere in sight. He then heard her muffled screams coming from the basement. At first, the door was locked and wouldn't open, but after adrenaline and brute force, Darren thankfully was able to open it. He then retrieved his hysterical child and brought her to the safety of the safe room. Once inside the room, the family huddled together in fear as they continued to hear movement and noises all throughout the house. After this abhorrent nightmare of a situation, the family knew they had to get out of the house. This situation and the many other paranormal experiences had led to a lifelong fascination for Darren Evans with the occult and finding out just exactly what Sozo is. But was it worth jeopardizing his family's safety? It took some time, but the family would soon relocate to another home. And once his family was safe, Darren was able to continue his deep dive into the unknown to try and track down and decipher just what this entity could be and where it came from. 
And although he knew the topic was vast, I think it went far deeper than he ever anticipated. Whilst trying to dig up more information, he posted his experiences to an old paranormal forum in 2009, and since then, many, many people have shared their experiences with a demonic force, many of which have been documented and compared by Darren himself on his website. But these experiences are not just a 21st or even 20th century phenomenon. They date back far older than that. Not every fine detail will be mentioned here, but I will do my best to list the most important details that I could find in regards to the origin of Zozo, according to Darren and other online sources. Zozo, in the old Bosque language, means blackbird or crow. The Zo people of Haiti practiced a form of voodoo whose rituals involve horrific scarification as well as the intake and passing around of bodily fluids and bizarre rituals. Their witch doctors are called Zozo and wear demonic-looking masks. As part of their death ritual, when someone is passing away, they lift up the mask at the moment of death to take in the person's final breath. This is apparently done to absorb the soul of the person to gain more spiritual power. Zozo, also in the Malay language, is the same as it is in English, but it translates to wandering spirit, which is a spirit they believe to steal people's souls while they sleep, which is also bizarre because sleep is often considered the cousin of death. Zozo has been called the minister of deception. It is known to convince you that it is a deceased loved one, or friend, or even someone you've idolized, when in reality, it's not. Sessions typically start out friendly and inviting, but soon turn malevolent and dangerous. During his research over the years, Darren made contact with and spoke to famous demonologist John Zaffis, who shared with him that in his experience of over 40 years of studying the demonic and paranormal, the name Zozo and other pseudonyms of its name kept coming up in his investigations, which too led him to seek answers as to what it could be. In some of those investigations, when questioned, the demon stated that it was the son of Satan himself. But Zaphis thinks perhaps as with many deities that seem to be lurking in the shadows. Zozo could be an entity that's existed far before the founding of Christianity. Besides evidence showing up in Africa and Egypt, there's also evidence found linking Zozo to ancient Mesopotamia as well. Other names Zozo has gone by throughout the ages have been Zuzu, Zaza, and Mama among many others. The name Zuzu could refer to Puzuzu, the famed demon from the film The Exorcist, which in reality was a demonic entity from ancient Mesopotamian religion. It's incredibly strange to note the following as well. Zozo was replaced in the story of the exorcism of Roland Doe when Peter Blatty was using it as inspiration to write The Exorcist. He changed Zozo to Pazuzu. Zozo is believed to be the demon that possessed Roland. It was described as a terrifying form that first appeared in the Neo-Assyrian period, roughly around 934 to 610 BC. It had a monstrous head resembling a fierce lion or a dog with horns, and had an emaciated human body with clawed hands, a scorpion's tail, and two sets of wings. One translation reads, I am Pazuzu, the son of Hanbu, king of the Lilu demons. I have scaled the powerful mountains. They trembled. The contrary winds were headed west. One by one, 
I broke their wings. Pazuzu and other demons like it were held responsible for ailments like disease, fetal death, nightmares, and much more. Could it be that this ancient demonic force is what could be plaguing people all the way into modern times? The demon Zozo is also mentioned in the French demonic encyclopedia as one of the demons responsible for diabolical possession and corruption. The possession of a young girl in 1816 is noted as a documented case where Zozo, among several other demons, were present. Other noteworthy possession cases over the ages, ranging closer to modern times, that bear Zozo's name, other than the exorcism of Roland Doe in the 1950s, are the possession of Doris Blither in 1972 in Los Angeles, the Einfield poltergeist incident in 1977 in the UK, and as recent as 2012, where a possession incident led to an attempted murder. Other theories with how this entity could communicate with so many people so quickly and across the globe over the years, besides supernatural ability of its own, would be that its own reach is perhaps being strengthened by an egregore or a collective group of thought form created by occultists for a certain purpose. However, this seems unlikely considering the entity doesn't seem to serve any human interest other than to destroy the person or people's lives it makes contact with. Egregores are typically formed to bring control over a summoned deity for the person or group's bidding. But perhaps instead there is a cult worshipping Zozo. I mean, that would make more sense to me. People who have made contact with the entity via a spirit or Ouija board have also been asked to chant or spell out phrases in Hebrew or Latin which has convinced many of the intelligence of the being that they are speaking with. What is also interesting is that the letter Z was actually removed from the original Latin alphabet because it was considered too evil when pronouncing it. It was said that one's face would make a death's grimace like that of a corpse, and that it mimicked the letter S like an evil twin. Perhaps the entity uses this name as some sort of mocking, whether to God or something else. One may also ask, despite the origin theories and historical details that could be linked to this ancient demonic force, how would one know if they encountered such a thing? These are what's known as Zozo's calling cards when it's being summoned using a Ouija board. The obvious is there that the planchette will begin to move on its own, but some less obvious signs are there as well, and are as follows. The planchette will move in a rainbow pattern from side to side, spelling Z-O, Z-O, over and over again, also known as the rainbow effect. It can also move in repeating figure eight movements, like an infinity sign. The planchette will spell out various versions of the demon's name, like Zozo, Zoso, Zaza, Zuzu, or Mama. You may also begin to see shadows moving around the area where you are hosting the session, like you're seeing through the thinnest sheet into a dark world that exists just behind your vision. And you and whoever you may be with may start to feel scared, uneasy, or upset, seemingly for no other reason, before or after this takes place. When you tell this entity goodbye, typically the best way to close a session, it may not truly be goodbye, because oftentimes, depending on how long the session has been for, like an ever-widening door, the entity may have had just enough time to sneak in to begin to wreak havoc upon your life. And thus begins what many demonologists 
and religious leaders alike call demonic obsession, which is where the entity becomes aware of you and begins to crave you, which then leads to oppression, or begins to inflict various forms of torture upon you in an effort to break you down, whether that's physically, psychologically, or spiritually. It will also work to isolate you from others, especially those who care about you. And finally, if you're incredibly unlucky, possession, where the entity finally takes control of you as its vessel. All of which to me are absolutely terrifying in every imaginable way. Darren Evans to this day continues to research the Zozo phenomena having been involved in a number of paranormal investigations, shows, and various other public and private events, as well as radio shows and podcasts, many of which he goes into various degrees of details regarding his encounters, other people's encounters, and other various historical details. He also in 2016 compiled his years worth of research and experiences into a book also titled The Zozo Phenomena, which you can read and learn more about the entity and the topic as a whole if you're interested. I'll link it below. I also pulled a lot of this information from various interviews, which I'll also be linking below, as well as an older website he runs that doesn't seem to have been updated in a while, but supplied me with much information to get the story as cohesive as I possibly could. I also sourced the photos of the apparitions from this site, some of which were taken by Evans himself over the years. So does this demon or ancient force truly exist? Is it some kind of elder god, a pre-Christian deity or being, or manifestation of occult or Luciferian practices? Did Darren Evans just make it up? And did thousands of people find it interesting enough to make up their own stories and partake in a mass charade that has lasted years? All of these answers may never truly be known, but my opinion is this. I think, not only given the wide array of strange coincidences and details throughout history, from the origins to the stories of this creature existing in distant past to the present, literally thousands of people, from casual interest in the occult to more hardcore fanatics, religious scholars, demonologists, and more, claiming to have had experiences with this thing. With all of these details in mind, I certainly think it very well could be real. I do think there are things that exist in the shadows, things we can't see or touch, but that are there watching and waiting to strike when and if the opportunity presents itself. So my advice to all of you to avoid any possibility of opening a door that you can't close and inviting evil into your life is this. Don't mess with Ouija boards. These things are not toys and whether you believe it or not, these entities do exist and they believe in you. So keep away from them, because you might just let something in that won't want to leave, even if you say goodbye. Winter of 1988 in California. A woman by the name of Jackie Hernandez had just left her husband. Her marriage was rocky to say the least. A domestic drama, a story which is all too common in this world. Working with a limited budget, she had a small amount of things, her two-year-old son Jamie, and was pregnant with her second child. What should have been a happy development that was now bittersweet due to being overshadowed by the problems presented by an unhappy marriage. She soon found a small house located in San Pedro that seemed like it could be just what she needed to get back on her feet. Although it would take some time, 
She was willing to do what she needed to do to get out of the marriage and take care of her children. Before the family would move into the home and begin to inhabit its walls, what they didn't realize was that they already weren't alone. Jackie would later say that she always had a fear of someone breaking into her home, especially when she began to live alone, but that upon crossing the threshold of this new house, and although for a seasoned criminal, it would have been all too easy to break into if they had so wished, that fear was somehow gone. At first, she said that she felt a presence, something that was not of this world, but that she felt almost protected and at ease which was something she wasn't used to. And this presence would begin to show itself in small, but strange ways. The very first thing Jackie said she ever experienced was when she had friends over. One of her friends was sitting at a table near her in the kitchen, and the other on a couch in the living room, as she passed by another desk that held a cup full of pins. Although several feet away, her and her friend in the kitchen were awestruck, when the cup glided by itself across the table it was sat on and towards Jackie. It then collapsed to the floor, shattering the cup. Stricken with curiosity as to how that could have happened, they were confused and surprised to say the least. But not having the answers, before too long, this seemingly innocent strangeness would become a distant memory. However, the presence that Jackie had been feeling would begin to show its true intentions. In February of 1989, the activity seemed to escalate. As she wakes up, Jackie heads to her children's room to see if they're still asleep. Upon walking into the room, she is stopped dead in her tracks. Sitting beside her sleeping son, on the lowest bunk bed, is a man in a red flannel shirt and jeans. His skin is gray. His face looks angry. A living, rotting corpse is staring at her son. She is so scared, she can't even scream, even if she wanted to. The man glances at her menacingly and then vanishes. She panics and calls several friends to help her, but after they arrive, they find nothing. And this would only mark the beginning of the frightening specter revealing itself. Multiple of Jackie's friends and even her neighbor would witness things they couldn't explain in the months to come. The neighbor's name was Susan Castaneda, and in her words, she would later say, At first, when Jackie said that she felt something, I didn't really believe her. I thought it was her own confidence in herself. But that was until the manifestations began to show themselves to her, and then to me. I don't know what it is that I saw, but I saw it. I smelled it. I experienced it. It touched me and it talked to me. It even visited my house to let me know that it was real. One night, as it stormed outside and rain tapped the glass of the windows of her bedroom, Susan was sound asleep. But as she slept, something supernatural was churning, like the storm outside her house. She was suddenly startled awake when she heard a massive banging noise in her room. However, this wasn't thunder that she was hearing. Her large antique lamp on the other side of her bed had somehow been moved. It had been thrown into the middle of the room and now laid in pieces. As she made this discovery, a flash of lightning illuminated the room. And standing before her was a man. His face was like that of a dead person. His eyes were angry. And suddenly, as quickly as the room lit up, as the illumination dissipated, he was gone. But something peculiar was left in his wake. A putrid and rotting smell. After the experience Susan had, which would be one of many to come, another friend by the name of Darlene, who would regularly babysit Jackie's children, Jamie and Samantha, while Jackie was at work, would have an experience of her own. One afternoon, as the children watched cartoons on TV in the living room, Darlene got up to use the restroom. As she stepped back into the hallway and headed towards the small home's bathroom, she was greeted by a voice that called out to her from inside the darkened room. 
it very intensely said, don't come back here. Later describing the voice as very creepy and spine chilling, she did as she was told, fearing that if she didn't, whatever this thing was, would become violent. As the days passed, Jackie only became ever more restless, but the activity persisted, only becoming more aggressive and more visible. A strange liquid began to drip from the walls and various crevices throughout the house with no logical origin. Weirded out by this, but not knowing what it was, Jackie would clean it up and just try to go about her day. However, whatever had been causing all of these events was far from finished. One evening, when placing a storage bin inside of her attic to try and conserve what little space she had, she felt as if she was being watched. To her shock and amazement, she began to see what she would later describe as a floating head coming towards her. But upon seeing the specter, it picked up speed dramatically. It came at her so quickly that she panicked and fell off the chair that had been propping her up to gain access to the attic. Following this incident, she began to hear loud noises emanating from the attic above, coupled by whispers coming from the small access door above her laundry room. Getting no sleep and reaching her breaking point, Jackie began to get desperate for some kind of help. Her friend and neighbor Susan had recently seen a show on TV of a crew who investigated the haunting of the Queen Mary, and after some digging, she was able to find their phone number. So at Susan's recommendation, Jackie gave them a call. After discussing what she had experienced, her point of contact passed the information along to the group, where she was then contacted back, and together they set up a time for all of them to meet and to begin a potential investigation. The group consisted of a fairly well-known parapsychologist and other professionals in assistive fields. The parapsychologist was Barry Taft, who had been involved in over 3,000 cases, and at one point investigated the same case that would later become famous for a movie adaptation known as The Entity. A professional cameraman named Barry Conrad also joined them. He had previously worked for NBC and ABC and had won multiple awards in his field for his expert work behind the lens. And lastly, a photography expert by the name of Jeff Wheatcraft would complete the main crew. Having spent multiple years as a photography expert in New York, he was well versed in debunking photos. He was also a well-known and heavy skeptic, an important piece when trying to remain scientific in a field such as this. All three would arrive for the first time at the San Pedro home on August 8th, 1989. Upon their initial surveying of the home, they would unanimously agree that it felt as if there was a massive pressure around them and in their ears. This pressure felt as if they were deep underwater. Alongside this, the home had a very peculiar scent. A foul and rotting type of smell seemed to permeate the air within its walls. After an initial walkthrough, the crew would then interview Jackie and Susan in the living room, where they were introduced to many of the details of what they both said they had experienced. Upon hearing Jackie's account of a disembodied head flying towards her in the attic, Jeff, although not voicing it at the time, didn't believe her. But knowing what they were there to do, he suggested that the group at least take a look in the attic to see if they could feel anything. He then volunteered to be the first to go into the attic, thinking that it would simply be empty and this lady was spinning a fantasy. As he climbed above the laundry room and into the space, flashlight and camera in hand, he began to walk around, and the first thing he noticed was that he felt as if he was being watched by something that he couldn't see, so much so that the hair on his body began to stand on end. Trying to shake the feeling that someone or something was practically breathing down his neck, Jeff began to take photos before he was going to descend back to the main level of the house. He snapped one photo, two photos, but upon snapping the third photo, something, an invisible force yanked his camera from his hands. Dumbstruck by what had just taken place, he screamed and ran 
descending the attic as quickly as he could. Upon seeing the rest of the crew, white as a ghost himself, he took a minute or two to collect himself before working up the nerve to go and retrieve his camera. As he climbed back into the attic, much more cautiously this time, he noticed that the camera wasn't anywhere near where he had been standing. Instead, the lens was standing up in one corner of the attic, and the body of the camera was in the complete opposite corner from where it had been pulled from his hands. He would retrieve it as quickly as he could, and descend yet again. He would later say that after his initial experience, that he knew, he just knew in his soul that there had to be something up there. The group would further discuss a plan of action and continue to speak with the ladies in the living room until it was decided that Jeff and Barry would reascend into the attic together to try and record some kind of video of the space. However, every time that Barry attempted to take the camera up into the attic, it would shut off. Thinking that this was some kind of battery issue, he would go back down only for the video camera to come back on. During this troubleshooting process, Jeff was again targeted. He was pushed by unseen hands. He was pushed with so much force that he had to grab a hold of a wooden beam in the attic to keep from falling through the entrance. Upon making his way back down as well, thoroughly shocked by everything that he had experienced so far, the entire group was then startled into silence when a loud banging noise began to come from the far reaches of the attic itself. They hushed each other to listen. The following audio was taken at that very moment. Quiet. Damn. There has been noises in this room that come from right in the center, right here. Once it finally stopped, the group knew they were experiencing something they couldn't explain, and they were convinced that this was the real deal. Attempting to photograph whatever could have been making the noise, Jeff would partially put himself up into the attic to snap additional photos. He would then see multiple flashes of light, followed by what he described as a massive black shadow or presence that was huge and moving from side to side. The crew would then leave for the night shortly after this interaction and would plan to return several weeks later. However, shaken by what he had experienced, Jeff did not want to further participate. On August 28th of 1989, the remaining crew would return, and things at first seemed relatively quiet this time, not nearly as active as the first experience, and that was until about 4 a.m. Sitting in the kitchen, they began to see a strange liquid pour from inside the cabinets. This was the very same liquid Jackie had described to them that she had cleaned up several times before. The crew, since the opportunity presented itself, decided to take samples of this mysterious liquid and would have it sent off to a lab for analysis. As they collected samples from all over the house throughout the course of the night, they would also try and determine if there was any sort of potential, logical source as to where this liquid could be coming from. However, they would discover no pipes, no trickery, they had no valid explanation as to what could be causing this strangeness. The results from the lab once they were in were bizarre to say the least. The liquid was actually human blood plasma with a high concentration of copper and iodine, and the plasma had come from a human male. This stunned everyone and further deepened the mystery of this very unusual haunting. After this night, the crew planned to return after a short time while they examined the things they had captured thus far to try and determine just what could be causing the haunting. In the meantime, Jackie was left alone, or on rare occasion, with a friend. She would very often leave voicemails of what she was experiencing on Barry Conrad's answering machine. Shortly after their departure, one night as she was trying to sleep, the banging in the attic began again. As she sat terrified, waiting for it to stop, it would, but something new and equally horrifying would take its place. The sound of a deep, almost monstrous breathing began to manifest instead, and this manifestation made Jackie not only scared for her life, but come to the conviction 
that she wouldn't sleep in the house any longer and certainly could not live there anymore. Various members of the crew would stay with Jackie to further investigate when their schedules would permit in the days to come. However, there was one night in particular that wasn't just an ordinary episode. No, this night was a matter of life and death. September 4th of 1989, drained and exhausted, Jackie Hernandez was now alone in the home once again. Barry had just left the previous night after capturing additional footage. But upon his return, and after convening with his colleagues, he would soon have a frantic voicemail waiting for him. And this voicemail was from the woman who he had just left. It was from Jackie. Screaming as things broke in the background, she would describe what happened like this. Almost as soon as Barry left, things began to go crazy in the house. Items like dishes, knives, and other things were being thrown across the room. It was trying to hurt me. My kids' toys were being levitated and then being ripped apart before my very eyes. Even more frightening, as Jackie was leaving the frantic voicemail as the activity surrounded her, her phone line was cut mid-cry for help. The crew rushed down to San Pedro, but instead of picking her up and getting her as far away from the house as they possibly could, Jackie was surprised when the guys rushed inside the home with their equipment instead. At first glance, everything seemed to be calm, almost too calm. Jackie began telling the men that among the more chaotic activity she had been experiencing, she again had heard breathing and whispering coming from inside the attic. Jeff and a colleague named Gary of his decided that they would go up to investigate with Jeff feeling not so great about being back in the home once again. It had been nearly a month since his initial visit and experiences. At 12.50 a.m., Jeff and Gary would crawl into the attic. Within minutes, Jackie and Barry would hear what sounded like three distinct snaps, like someone snapping their fingers. As Barry was holding his camera with both his hands, and Jackie was standing directly beside him, they would then yell to Jeff and Gary that the activity was on the surface level and to come back down from the attic. Gary, who was closer to the exit, began to make his way towards it, and Jeff, who had been in the center of the attic holding his flashlight, began to take his steps towards the exit as well. However, little did Jeff know that these steps would be ones that he would never forget. Before Gary's very eyes and a camera lens, Jeff was hoisted into the air and against the ceiling by a support beam of the attic. He was being strangled by something that neither of them could see. As his legs kicked several feet off the ground, he dropped the flashlight. Unable to see, Gary snapped a series of photos to be able to see Jeff. He then ran to his aid to try and free him before whatever this was took his friend's life. He found that it was some kind of cord that had been tied around Jeff's neck and pulled to the ceiling. The cord had been secured by a bent nail that he actually had to bend straight to free him. Once Jeff was freed, he was then dragged as quickly as possible towards the exit as he came to. Jeff would later describe what his experience was like, like this. I remember feeling myself being strangled and then everything went black. That dark space of time that I lost, I felt so out of control. Once Jeff was out of the attic, the cord that was noosed around his neck, which had never previously been seen by anyone that had gone into the attic, was found and taken off him. These are photos moments after his exit. As Jeff tried to come to terms with what had just happened, as everyone else was frightened, Barry, the man behind the camera, was attacked next. A surge of electricity from his over-the-shoulder camera shocked him to the point of unconsciousness. At this point, everyone was terrified and knew that they had to leave immediately. As Jackie gathered her son and four-month-old daughter, she and the rest of the crew began to depart the house as quickly as they could. Jackie's daughter was now crying due to a large red mark on her forehead that came out of nowhere. 
The activity then began to pick up in the house as they were making their way out. Banging noises could be heard coming from inside the house as they all exited. They would all leave shortly after 3 a.m. this very night. In later interviews, Jackie Hernandez would say, I was in a way forced out by a ghost, but if I would have stayed, I would have been harmed or have had a nervous breakdown. I couldn't see a future staying there. I just knew that I couldn't stay there. It wasn't very long after that Jackie made her departure from the house, a permanent one. It would also be the last time that the crew and anyone else involved would step foot within the San Pedro home. However, this would not be the end. October of 1989. Wanting to get as far away as she possibly could, Jackie used what little resources she had to move to a modest trailer home over 300 miles north of San Pedro to Weldon, California. And although she still feared the nights, she felt as if whatever presence that dwelled within the San Pedro house had been left there. But she would be very wrong. The following year in April of 1990, one moonlit night, Jackie was woken up by a series of strange scratching sounds coming from inside the small storage shed in her backyard. Thinking it was an animal, she grabbed a flashlight and approached it. As she got to the door and pulled it open, the scratching sound stopped, and an all-too-familiar sense of fear came flooding back. Although she didn't hear anything else going bump in the night, all the hair on her body stood on end, just like it had at the San Pedro house. Just weeks after this development, Jackie would see a large black mist float through the hallway and towards her daughter's room, rushing to make sure her child was okay. She passed the threshold of the room and immediately panicked. The comforter in which her daughter was laying on was on fire. Bizarrely, it looked as though someone or something had touched or sat down exactly where the spot was burning. Thankfully, her children were okay after she very quickly extinguished the flames and then snapped a series of photos as evidence afterwards, believing the presence to be back in their lives. The black mist, however, was nowhere to be found. As a result of the past dealings at the San Pedro house, as well as the resurgence in her new home, Jackie began to suffer horrific panic attacks and almost constant anxiety as a result of the trauma that she had endured. She wouldn't be able to breathe when the knocks would begin at night and they were always in threes. Having kept in touch with the guys who had been documenting the San Pedro phenomenon, Jackie had kept them up to date on the new incarnation. Never having seen this type of haunting before, the crew wanted to come up and see for themselves if this thing, this entity, had indeed followed her to her new home. It was midnight, Friday, April the 13th, when Barry and Jeff arrived. In later interviews, Jeff would say, Many people have asked me, after what you experienced, why on earth would you go following this woman and her ghosts? The only response I could give is that I was compelled to finish this case. I wanted to see it through to the end, to some kind of conclusion. By this time, Jackie's nearby neighbors had experienced some activity themselves, which only began to take place after her arrival. One incident that happened was that several of her neighbors were moving a new television into their home when the face of an old man with evil eyes materialized in the screen. It was seen by both husband and wife moving it. Word had slowly gotten around after this night. Some of the teenage neighbors in the area noticed that there was an unfamiliar van parked outside of Jackie's house. After knocking on the door and getting the info as to what was happening, the two teens left and quickly came back with a Ouija board, hoping to assist. Given the time spent coming up, the desire to make contact, and to try and gain some sort of a resolution, and that it was a full moon on Friday the 13th, the crew thought that perhaps this was their best and only opportunity to contact whatever this thing was, and to try and elicit a response, and a response they would get. As they placed the board upon a table that all of them could sit around, the atmosphere was icy cold. At first, nothing happened, 
The board sat there idle, but within minutes, the entire table began to violently shake. The planchette began to move around the board and answer questions so quickly that all they could do was write down letters to try and decipher what it said. The candles around them flickered as if there were people running in the room, creating some kind of vortex. They asked just who the entity was, and it told them. It said it was a man who had been murdered, held underwater, and drowned in San Francisco Bay in the year 1930. They asked how many spirits walk the earth. It replied with, Phantoms fill the skies around you. Jeff then asked it, Why are you targeting me? Why do you hate me? It replied with, You have the likeness of my killer. They then asked, Who in this room do you harbor hatred for? The board then spelled out, Jeff. Within seconds, Jeff himself was picked up multiple feet into the air and thrown into the wall behind his chair. This violence concluded the session. Jeff would come two minutes later with an injured back, and everyone would soon exit the trailer to try and make sense of the ordeal. When day broke, it was as if the presence was weakened or went back into hiding within the darkness. Days after the unearthly encounter, Bear decided to take the information that he had gained and visit the news pilot, the local newspaper there in San Pedro, to look through old articles to see if he could verify what the specter had told them. He soon found an article dating back to March 25th of 1930, where the body of a man named Herman Hendrickson had been discovered. His body had washed up in San Francisco Bay. Police believed he had been a victim of foul play due to a compound fracture in his skull, but due to a lack of evidence, his death would ultimately be ruled accidental. Herman Hendrickson was a seaman who worked upon a lumber company vessel known as the Astoria. Feeling compelled that he was onto something, Barry then took photos of the cord that had been tied around Jeff's neck in San Pedro to the local docks to ask around. Upon speaking to an elderly and career fisherman, he was told that the knot was a bowline knot, a very common knot that had been used on the seas for hundreds of years. It was as common now as it would have been in the 1930s and prior, and that whoever had tied it had been connected with the ocean in their profession. Given the resurgence of the supernatural in her new home, Jackie's patience was paper thin. She decided once again to move in June of 1990, in hopes of leaving the entity behind for good. She would relocate back to San Pedro and move into a small apartment home on 7th Street. Not wanting to take any chances, she had a local priest come in and bless her home before she and her family would live there. But again, horrifically, it had moved with her. From the very first night, the same phenomena began to rear its ugly head again. From lights flickering, objects moving on their own, and balls of light materializing and moving throughout the room. Jackie was once again plagued by an ethereal force, but she wasn't the only one. Every time the guys would return from a separate investigation, a photography shoot, or anything in between, they too were met with odd happenings. The first and one of the more worrisome things to happen was that their gas burners in their apartment began to turn themselves on and ignite. Following this continuous show of power, it began to rearrange and move objects such as photographs. It then began to scale in intensity in the weeks to come, as an unseen force broke multiple windows and began to place furniture upside down. It would eventually reach a crescendo, a blitz of violent and vulgar displays. About 50 different items were moved with Gary from the previous investigation, also being present alongside Jeff and Barry as witnesses. In the middle of the action, in an effort to communicate once again, a letter and pen was placed in the middle of the stove at approximately 3.58 a.m., only to have the burners be turned on by themselves, and the letter moved and ignited within five minutes. Whatever the entity was wanted them to know that it was there 
and that no one's home was sacred, and whatever doubt that was once present had now been extinguished. When the case initially began in 1989, no one could have predicted the longevity and persistence of the paranormal phenomena that was to take place and just how many people it would affect. Today, Jackie Hernandez still experiences minor bouts of spirit activity, but things have long since calmed down from the days of 1989 and through the 1990s. Thankfully for her now, she's able to exhibit a relatively normal life although her fear of what could be lurking in the darkness still sits in the back of her mind. But before we go, I do have some questions about the case, some that you may be asking yourself. But ultimately, although I will propose these questions, the conclusion is yours to make. Just what caused the spirit to haunt the home in which Jackie found herself in San Pedro? If it truly was a drowned and tormented soul who harbored hatred as it claimed to be, why would it find a residence over 400 miles away to haunt? And why would it pick Jackie of all people? Or could it have been anyone at that specific time and in that specific place? Could it have been the fact that she was vulnerable or something else? She also claimed to have never opened any sort of doors or dabbled in any sort of occult activity. Although most of the time, that is the way these entities find their way into our world. But perhaps later on, when they asked and received their answers via Ouija board and the Weldon home, maybe they allowed the spirit to become more present. Although it bothered other people like the friends and neighbors of Jackie, and followed Jackie to multiple residences, perhaps it was strengthened through this process, considering for a time the manifestations seemed to become stronger. Although many people consult a religious leader, like a priest, to try and cleanse a home or rid themselves of these kinds of entities, why didn't that work when Jackie moved into the final apartment on 7th Street? Could the entity have perhaps attached itself to her? Or, and although there is no evidence to support this, could her husband or relative unhappy with the divorce have placed some kind of hex or curse upon her? Just some food for thought as to how she found herself in this position. One of the more uncommon traits of this haunting, and one that still baffles me and others alike, was how was human blood plasma able to seep from various areas within the house? And just whose plasma was it? I've yet to find another case where this has happened. To me, it's absolutely bizarre. But then again, these aren't normal things that we're dealing with. These events are supernatural, so therefore, what doesn't make sense to me, perhaps makes sense in the grand scheme of things. And lastly, was it even a human spirit at all, or could it have been something from the demonic realm? Considering the knocks, especially in the trailer home, came in threes, this is usually indicative of the demonic, not to mention the manifestations of power and the clear, violent, and malicious intent. Along with these many questions, we still find ourselves with even fewer answers than we'd like to when it comes to this now infamous case known as the San Pedro Haunting. But a few things are for certain. These things do exist, and whether you believe based on what you've seen or learned, or you're a hardened skeptic, sometimes it takes the other world staring at you directly in the face to convince you otherwise, and your fear, your vulnerability, can attract and feed the things that go bump in the night, and perhaps fear of the unknown is a well-placed fear indeed.